Welcome to my conversation with Martha Nockhamson. Uh Martha Nockhamson wrote the book The Passion of David Lynch in the 1990s, followed up by David Lynch Swerves uh, in the 2000s, and now she's followed up with a third book, not just on David Lynch, but which he's definitely heavily a part of, and it's called Television Rewired, The Rise of the Auteur Series. So, Martha, welcome to the show, and uh, I want to start off by just asking you how this book came about both through your previous conversations and work with David Lynch and also other things that you've written or other conversations you've had uh, over the years because it is sort of a merging of of different streams in a way. Uh, Yeah, well, thank you for your welcome. I'm really happy to be here. And, okay, uh, how did this book come about? I wrote Television Rewired to raise the level of discourse about the amazing evolution of American television beginning in 1990. The reason I wrote my books on David Lynch was because the discourse about David was trivializing and dumbed down and was really working against um, the possibility that uh, we could see and enjoy and be changed by the by his art, and I saw that artists who started working in television um, because they were inspired by his freedom from the old repressive formulaic rules were being treated exactly the same way. There was, I mean, there's a lot of good encyclopedic work out there, you know, a lot of entertainment journalists who really know their stuff about, you know, the old television shows and what came after that, and they've got lots of great facts. But what was very clear to me was that the whole concept that television could become a source of art and a continuation of the great literary tradition of America that we can trace back to Nathaniel Hawthorne was being lost on them. Um, They were, so, so to speak, stuck in the details, you know, couldn't see the forest for the trees. And um, I... um, I'm, you know, I don't consider myself to be very special or a prophet or anything like that, but I have taken on a very special mission, um, and that is uh, I want to celebrate Otter Television in terms of what Lynch did to celebrate it as an extension of the great tradition of American literature, and because I believe that the, you know, if I were divine, defining a a Department of Defense, it wouldn't be uh, military. That's the least of it, um, and and certainly has many drawbacks too. Um, the real power of a country lies in its stories. Countries without viable stories deteriorate. There's nothing at the core uniting people, um, and. If we lose our faith in our stories or misperceive them or confuse them with stories that really aren't art at all, that really do not unify us, that do not perform the the job of literature, then we become weaker and we become less of who we are. In addition to your work with David Lynch, it seems you've also certainly with David Chase, the creator of The Sopranos, had a a similar sort of rapport over the years. You're not only discussing the new season and the original seasons of Twin Peaks, but also The Sopranos, Mad Men, The Wire, uh, Girls, Lena Dunham show, and then several others that you, you, uh, Trem, uh, the David Simon show, Uh, and then you talk about... Treme, Treme, sorry, yeah. I'm sorry, yeah, Um, Treme. And and so, you know, it, it seems that you are able to bring together in this both your work with Lynch, but also work with some auteurs who uh, I think some people might see the obvious connection with Lynch, but others might be more surprised. One of the things that I wanted also to uh, to talk about 
was what it means to be Lynchian. Now, God knows nobody has ever accused David Chase, whom I I consider the Sopranos. I mean, of course, David Lynch is a great artist. He, you know, how many of them we have right now, I don't know. But, you you know, a culture rarely has more than three or four at at the time. I mean, he's pretty much alone in his class. But The Sopranos is almost flawless. As um, as a series, 86 brilliant episodes, which we can't really say about Twin Peaks. There have been, um, as you know from the book, all kinds of starts and stops because of adverse industrial circumstances, which Chase did not face. Chase had the confidence of HBO almost from the get-go, maybe from the get-go, from the time he walked into Richard Plepler's office with four videotapes, you know, to say, you know, do you want to pick these up? Okay, and that has meant everything. But nobody has ever called um, Chase Lynchian. Nobody has ever called David Simon Lynchian. Nobody has ever called Matthew Weiner Lynchian, but certainly not Lena Dunham or Eric Overmeyer, who I, I wanted to sort of bring under this umbrella that you hadn't mentioned in, in your question. Mm-hmm. Eric collaborated with David Simon on the on the creation of Tree May. I'm saying in this book something that I think is extremely important that they are Lynchian, that they are Lynchian in the most profound sense of the word, and that's part of what I have in mind of talking about in the book. And what do I mean by that? Well, they don't have a red room. Uh, They don't have little men dancing. They don't have a dead girl in a tiny town somewhere uh, in a beautiful section of America. What they have is freedom. What Lynch did, and this is such a motivating force for me, what Lynch did uh, when he appeared, well, what he did was to model freedom within an extremely repressive system. Um, As most people either know or, you know, kind of vaguely feel or intuit by themselves, what we all feel is how repressive uh, formula television is, even those of us who don't give the the, the name to it. Um, formulaic, don't say that. But we feel that there's a straitjacket that uh, writers are working with, that actors are working with, producers, and all the creative um, members of the community of television. Um, and what Lynch did was he modeled freedom. When somebody creates a television series, now, now, movies, freedom has already been modeled. Um, Maybe it was modeled from the get-go. Of course, it was Hollywood that put certain uh, straight jacket on it. Uh, But freedom of the film, uh, uh, you know, auteur and and creator, that, that came along pretty naturally. But the system of television was a very, very restraining and and repressive system. And to be Lynchian is to be free, to express your own point of view and your own vision so contagious. Um, People working on Twin Peaks, people working on The Sopranos, people working on um, Mad Men and on... Um, of The Wire and in Girls and certainly Treme, they caught the spirit of freedom from Lynch, from the other auteurs, and they became released. And what we got was a chain reaction of um, the release of creative energy. Now, this did not happen on shows like the X Files, or let me let me let me be less, uh, you know, binary about it. Uh, it didn't happen to anywhere near the extent. It happened a little, because wherever you put creative people, no matter how you try to tie them down, they're going to give you something. Um, 
it didn't happen on Breaking Bad. It didn't happen on any of the formulaic shows that came after Twin Peaks that became to look a little jazzier, you know, take a few more risks, but really were not art. They're just formula. And I think it's so important, you know, so if you get somebody talking about a formulaic show like The Killing uh, as Lynchian, it, it just seems like a crime against uh, human beings. Um, <laughs> To, I know that is really, really extreme, uh, and maybe I don't really, <laughs> I, maybe I don't mean it quite that extreme. But to confuse, you know, because it's mm-hmm. a, a girl being killed in a small town, you know, sort of, oh God, you know, sort of, that's everything that David Lynch does not represent. He doesn't. He's not looking for people to come along and imitate him that way. But I think. If I if I understand our conversations, and I hope I do, um, he is thrilled by the sense that he might be opening up doors and modeling freedom. So uh, that's why these shows that I've talked about, specifically shows that are Lynchian in their free approach to expression and to storytelling, are in the same book to show that they represent a very coherent evolution um, in American entertainment uh, that has inspired formulaic writers but is different from formulaic writing. And don't get me started on uh, Game of Thrones, which is <laughs> really bad news. As I far wouldn't as even I'm know concerned. where to begin. I watched a couple right. episodes and I couldn't get into it. <laughs> Amazingly bad stuff. Well, it's actually, that's sort of a good pivot point to mention that as we discuss this book, we are going to be focusing quite a lot on Twin Peaks, I think, but I'm going to be avoiding Mad Men and The Wire because I'm making my way through Mad Men and Breaking Bad and The Wire uh, over a, a period of writing about each episode, really almost partly for my own sake, just sort of documenting for myself the process of watching a show and, and what I think as it goes along. So. I've been right. somehow remarkably avoided uh, finding out too much. So uh, so those we'll have a, a, a follow-up conversation someday on those shows. Oh, but, that would uh, be fun, sure. I wanted to hear, first of all, if how you would define formulaic for the, the listeners or readers who may not have read your book yet. And also, as a follow-up to that, um, well, maybe I'll just ask a follow-up after you after you, I guess, address that. Okay, how do you define formulaic? Okay, um, yeah, it's such a basic question and so important because the concept is so crucial uh, to what I'm trying to say. Mm-hmm. So yes, I took some pains in the in the introduction to uh, try to get at what formulaic means. Well, we know what it means in a lab, right? In a lab, in a scientific experiment. Yeah, I right. mean, okay. we, we know what a formula is, and it's extremely precise. Um, you you have a whole bunch of symbols and an equivalent sign, and 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 supposedly, uh, if you put certain things together 150 times, you will get the same result. Yeah, mm-hmm. and that's a formula. Okay. Of course, in speaking about storytelling, you can't get that precise. And um, as you know from reading my book, I, I worked on five um, network daytime soap operas, um, um, which is a very formulaic craft. Um, And when I say formulaic, I'm not really saying um, that it doesn't have an emotional impact. I'm not not really saying that it isn't interesting or fun. Uh, I'm saying something quite different. Um, I'm I'm saying something that cannot be reduced to a system of rules. I guarantee you, no person, even writing soap operas, which are extremely formulaic, no person working in storytelling and television has ever been handed a sheet of rules saying, you know, this is how you do it or this is what you can't do. Uh, uh, What it is is a general understanding um, that you're going to be telling a linear story um, 
in which there is, well, I'm going to use the term that I use in my book, a perfect narrative, um, in which, uh, which features a perfect hero. Okay, so what is a perfect hero? A perfect hero, and if you if you just close your eyes and imagine any show you've ever seen, um, a perfect hero is one who dominates his, usually, or her context. That is, yeah, there could be problems along the way, but nothing is going to happen that the perfect hero won't eventually be able to resolve, dominate, conquer, bring to a harmonious conclusion. Okay. Now, what does this mean? This means that when you have a perfect narrative, it must never include anything that escapes the control of the hero maybe for a little while, but ultimately not. Um, the perfect narrative, and of course we didn't think about this when we were writing uh, stories um, on soap operas, and nobody does in nighttime television either, but underneath it all, you know that you can't do that. And so you have a story like Columbo, where um, your model is Sherlock Holmes, uh, who takes a vast world of experience and simplifies it down to a few pertinent clues that he identifies with clarity, preternatural clarity, and he you know, comes to a conclusion where he resolves, dominates, controls, etc. Okay, now that um, in, you know, sort of, kind of gets at what a perf what what a formulaic show is it's going to be conclusive it is not going to leave any serious um loose ends and it is not going to include any sights and sounds that distract you um from watching your perfect hero riding along narrative train tracks. No freedom to wander, just those tracks that lead toward a conclusive ending. Mm -hmm. uh, that's as close as I can get to what a uh, perf you know what a formulaic uh, show is, and just a moment's reflection. Um, you know, just even if you start thinking about the sights and sounds of a Lynch um, work or the Sopranos or any of them that we're mentoring, um, the sights and sounds lead you off into various places, you know, that that would distract you from what the hero is doing. There are little buzzes and, and lights blinking on and off when when Cooper is trying to solve a mystery. That's not stylistic or funny, you know, in, in the in a reduced sense of the word. That's the universe that we're being um uh included in and it is a non formulaic fictional universe in as opposed to Columbo where we ne never see anything that isn't going to eventually help us to follow him as he concludes. So would you say it's a primarily uh, narrative formula and that even to the extent it's stylistic, it's a uh, style in the service of that central narrative formula and that everything yeah. kind of emanates from that? Okay. Style repressed by. Gotcha. Uh, everything is repressed. What you see, what you hear, what you're really allowed to feel. Um, you know, it's sort of, you have to be powerfully rebellious to look at some of these things. I, 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 I find that when I watch a formulaic show, I'm caught up in it. It's mm -hmm. very powerful. In this conversation so far, you've basically emphasized the hero's journey toward an achievable goal as being the essence of formula, but when we use those terms, exceptions kind of come to mind for me in both directions. So on the one hand, 
Uh, many essentially conventional stories, for example, episodes of Hill Street Blues, allow characters to fail, while many essentially unconventional stories, for example, Inland Empire, depict a kind of success. Of course, in the latter case, the character's path is anything but straight. I think we can agree with that about Inland Empire. Uh, to clarify for our listeners, when you define formula in your book, is it more about how narrow the protagonist's surrounding context is? So in other words, how defined and manageable the challenges they have to overcome are, more so than whether or not they succeed or fail in overcoming them? And also, I guess as a follow-up to that, does the rejection of formula and the acceptance of a more overwhelming, boundless reality kind of render questions of success or failure moot? Like, in other words, can you not really have a success or a failure when you're dealing with the kind of realities that Lynch and maybe even Chase and, and Weiner and others deal with? Okay. Uh, so the answer to your question is yes. Um, it's much more about the way success is contextualized, uh, what kind of universe the uh, the audience is entering into when they enter into a uh, art series or an auteur series. Uh, there was a major paradigm shift about context, and that changed everything. It changed the definition of success and failure, but it also changed the definition, or maybe definition is not quite the right word, but let's let's stick with that until something better, you know, r- arises for me. Sure. Um of desire, of the way audience desire is stimulated. So, uh the the universe of the um of the auteur series is the big paradigm shift. It's a paradigm shift toward the way we actually experience life and the way science and art um, and music are now uh, representing the way that we experience life. It's a much more connective experience um, than the formulaic um, television series which uh, is very disconnected from from life. It's a tiny little universe, a tiny little fictional world where um, it's true, uh, all details are manageable. Now, the question of whether the uh, the protagonist succeeds or not is is only a small part of it. Um, it has to do with the desire that we have for somebody who can take care of everything, mm-hmm. who can resolve things, who can um, who can give us a, um, um, certainty and clarity and and resolution. And of course, these things are not really possible in life. They are not possible either within the framework of theoretical physics now or art, or music, or any of the frameworks of the way people, you know, serious people are thinking. The desire in auteur television is for wonder, for uh, not the fantasy of a controlling perfect hero, but a connection to the wonder of how large the universe is, possibility. It's also a connection to the fear that we experience. And so Lena Dunham, who, as you know, is one of the auteurs that I'm talking about, she said, I write because I don't want people to feel alone. And in fact, formula television makes you feel alone in very many ways, even ways that you don't even know and don't think about, because all these people are in a nice, neat little world there. And there is this hero who can make sense of it all and 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 get it all neat and tidy and uh, and resolved. And we know our lives are not like that. So it does make you feel uh, more alone. Now, does this get to what you were interested in? Yes, definitely. I think I just realized uh, in the earlier part of the conversation, I think we focused a lot on the hero success or failure and how Twin Peaks and some of the subsequent shows change that, which is a part of what you're talking about. But obviously, when you get into that much larger context, you can see 
kind of the essence of formula versus non-formula probably has more to do, correct me if I'm wrong, but more to do with the surrounding world of the hero than necessarily exactly. the hero themselves. It, no, it's not perhaps, it, it, it is. For certain. <laughs> that, that is the paradigm shift. Gotcha. What's also very interesting is now that, it, you know, that that Lynch has modeled a kind of artistic freedom that we never saw before, we're getting all kinds of shows where we're in a gray area. You know, what mm. kind of universe is this, is this series showing us? For example, Fleabag. I don't know whether you've seen it. No, not familiar with that one. Uh, Phoebe Waller-Bridge, who was also the creator of Killing Eve. Yeah, I, I've j- I've just been been screening um, Fleabag, which is a really strange and wonderful show, and I was trying to apply my my thinking to it, and I thought this is really an interestingly gray area. But of course, comedy is an interestingly gray area mm-hmm. because comedy has always poked holes in the whole idea of of a perfect hero and a and a perfect narrative you know in the end they support it unless it's new comedy like Lena Dunham can you just for the listener who hasn't read the book yet talk a little bit about your idea of formula 2.0 that there are these films or these series which don't i don't think they exist in a gray area so much as they're trying to look more like the non formulaic television but they still have the essence of formula. Is that a correct? That's no, that's absolutely correct. Okay, so we have in chapter seven some very specifically chosen a formula two point zero a television series. Some of them I chose because I think they're very destructive. That they're they're trying to look alike. On, non-formulaic television, but they're just they're just muddying the waters. But there are a couple that I talk about that are very high-functioning formulaic, and what I mean by that is, and I'm particularly fond of Vince Gilligan's work on Breaking mm-hmm. Bad, which is not necessarily everybody's cup of tea, because it's it's a um, it, it's a, it's a rough and searing piece of work to look at. In the end, it's formulaic, and and you know the anti-hero has as much control as the hero does. He's just the flip Mm -hmm. side of it. That's an interesting distinction that I saw you make in the book is anti-heroes aren't really the opposite of heroes. They're just sort of a disguised hero in a way. They, They serve the same function in the narrative. Absolutely right. Well, what I was just going to sort of say to complete my point is that, uh, both the X files and breaking bad in very specific episodes and, and, you know, just a very small, percentage sure. of, of the large number of, of episodes bring us to the threshold uh. of the larger universe. And the desire that's created by those particular episodes is very different from the rest mm-hmm. of the series. But ultimately, it retreats. But I do find that very interesting. So 2.0, I mean, and if you if you just think about that for a minute you realize that if they can if a 2.0 series can do it for two episodes it can do it for 20 episodes so that you could conceivably have a 2.0 series that is really getting into a gray area mm-hmm. where you know the series is moving fluidly around in terms of what kind of universe it's asking you to believe in now how much of that formula do you think can be sort of aligned with the discussion that people have had, especially uh, post-Twin Peaks and in the cable era of episodic versus serialized television. Do you think, because you talk about some of the more serialized shows as also being uh, formulaic, do you see any sort of correspondence there or do you think it's a separate uh, problem or aspect? I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure. I understand what you're asking. So episodic, as in each episode tells a story uh, that at the end of which is resolved, and serialized as almost sort of a movie that's been broken into episodes or chapters over time. And of course, many shows will combine aspects of both. Twin Peaks itself. Uh, well, Twin Peaks, I think, was always primarily serialized, but you know. Uh, other shows will have a sort of a standalone episode story that maybe like the B story, or I guess that would be the A story or something, and then also be carrying on another serialized narrative. A so, larger so that's arc, something I've yeah. heard people talk about and also talk yeah, about yeah. in relation to Twin Peaks as a sort of a 
innovation or variation, but do you see that as entirely or somewhat distinct from this question of formula and the sort of heroic journey that that suggests? No, I don't. Uh, I don't see it as entirely distinct um, for this reason. Um, yeah, uh, episodic, you know, where you have like um, a Law and Order contained episode or exactly, a yeah. contained episode. Uh, it kind of m- is much more uh, uh, naturally leads to formulaic stories. But the truth of the matter is, and I will point to the Romanoffs that Matthew Weiner um, has since cre- created since I wrote the book, it looks like it's that. But when you see the whole series, you realize that each little episode has its own seeming narrative arc, but they are each impinging on the other and creating something quite revolutionary and and exciting. So it really depends on what the creator does. Um, It's easier for... I don't want to use the word hack. Now, just saying the word, of course, Mm -hmm. emotionally. Um, And some of us who write for Formula television are hacks. You know, it's just sort of like, all right, Give me the thing and I'll paint by numbers. Um, but uh, but a lot of people who write formulaic stuff, like uh, Vince Gilligan, he's really great. He's a great storyteller. Uh, he's using formula, and he will be the first one to tell you hmm. that he is, but he's a great storyteller. So this all varies with the talent, um, um, the ability uh, of, of or the vision of a particular creator. Um, David Chase told me that when he came with the idea of The Sopranos to HBO, he had wanted to have episodic. And they said, why don't you do an over, over um, overarching arc? Interesting. Yeah, I was fascinated. Um, and uh, in fact, he used the words that you used. He wanted every, each episode you know, to be a little movie of its own. Mm-hmm. Um, but of course, the brilliance of that show is these enormous arcs that you know reach over each other and until you get to this extraordinary um place um where you've really got a vision of the world that's it's quite quite exciting. Well, that actually jumps right into what my next question was going to be, which is, does an auteur, so understood as somebody in the sense of your work who creates non-formulaic television, do they have to be fluent in or at least proficient in formula to subvert it, or are they working in your conception entirely outside of it? Could it be both? Could, Could someone who has either no grounding or even just sort of an intuitive understanding of formula uh, in other words, I guess, are, is formula something that these TV shows are moving beyond, like through and beyond, or are they stepping entirely outside of it? Is it a misdirection in a way to even consider it as a sort of a building block of television? Okay. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, and, of course, this has a great impa- uh, you know, relevance to the way screenwriting is taught. Yeah. And I've done that, too. Um, if you, most people who are in, um, you know, the, the the programs and universities that are teaching screenwriting insist that you have to know formula in order to go beyond it. You know, eh, uh, I'll ask you a question. Do you think that Lynch knew formula before he worked? The only sense in which I would consider him knowing formula would be some sort of intuitive uh understanding of of i mean i guess that it depends too what you know in, in the sense that you're describing it isn't it specifically the tv formula and yeah. certainly the specific building blocks of how that sort of thing is supposed to be constructed uh, almost certainly no i mean he had no grounding or interest or real experience in television before creating twin peaks i would almost turn the thing inside out and upside down mm-hmm. um i Having done the little bit of, you know, paltry work that I did on soap opera, and believe me, I think that soap opera was a vehicle 
potential vehicle uh, for great entertainment. And, you know, my first book is about that. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it, it, it has completely collapsed for reasons we don't need to talk about. Uh, but just having been in that environment, I was stunned that David Chase, after 30 years of wearing the harness, could could spread his wings and fly. So mm. many people that I met, you know, I was a college professor while I was working, so I never identified myself, you know, within the boundaries of what my colleagues were, you know, kind of straitjacketed by. That was who they were. They were they were working in television. I was visiting, you know, which maybe is uh, – <laughs> I can see somebody wanting to criticize me for, you know, mm-hmm. peeking my head in uh, and then being able to open the door and say, okay, you all stay where you are. I'm I'm free. Um, you know, I kind of get that. Yeah. But, uh, but at the same time, I met so many people who told me that after doing particularly soap opera writing, but formula uh, you know, t- sitcom and the rest of it, writing, mm. they couldn't any longer tell mm. their own yeah. story. And the fact That's that he could is is the wonder to me. So do I think that I personally think that people need to go through the discipline, and we can call it a discipline of formulaic mm. writing. The answer is a resounding no. That's fascinating. I think it can be extremely hazardous to the health of a creative person. I left NYU, where I was teaching screenwriting, because I saw that it was the department policy to enforce um, what I would call formula writing Mm -hmm. uh, on the kids uh, and saying, well, you know, once you know this, then you can be free to break the rules. That's not what I saw. What I saw people, well, people, brilliant students with lots of talent whose wings were clipped. And mm. I, knew, I knew they'd never fly again. Uh, Very interesting. I just couldn't do it. You know, I couldn't do it. Some, sometimes I, I did things that skirted the rules, but... Um, of what they wanted me to do there, but I realized that eventually somebody would come over to me and say, "You're not doing what we want you to do. You know, either you do it or you leave." So I left. I mean, nobody said it to me, but I I was sure somebody would someday if yeah. I didn't leave. Well, that also there's a, there's really a couple or a few different um, aspects to this, I think, because there's the one which I think you're sort of addressing, which is working outside of the formula. Uh, altogether, um, not even sort of going through that path to get to, you know, not going through the marketplace to reach the palace, I guess. I guess you could say. Wow. And, uh, right, there we go. You Bringing speak it all my out. language. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've read your books. Um, and Thank there's you. also another aspect of, depending on what type of, you know, if you're creating like Stan Breckage or Maya Darren on television, then you probably needn't concern yourself at all with these things. But if you are sort of working within story tradition, sometimes there are um, situations you'll encounter where, you know, a formula might help you out of a jam or something, like it's judiciously used, let's say. But it also reminds me of something Pauline Kael wrote about, uh, I think, La Ventura, where she okay. said, uh, Michelangelo Antonioni is, is horrible at staging fight scenes. Um, but he's a great director. And she actually kind of turned on him a little after that. But at this time, she still liked him. And she was saying, uh, you know, he doesn't it, – it, she she used that as an example that uh, there's this idea. She was, her, she was actually using it, ironically, I guess, as a cudgel against some of the auteurs critics like an Andrew Saris and others who would say that these directors who come up sort of through the, the Hollywood sausage machine, you know, they – uh, need to sort of have that baseline competence as a workmanlike director to flower into great artists. And she was saying, well, look at this. This is a lousy fight scene he staged in this movie. He clearly has no competence doing, like, one of the most basic functions of, like, a genre film. But it doesn't really matter because that's not what Love and Tour is about. And that's not what makes it interesting. And that example has always 
stuck with me as a counterpoint because I, I think I've kind of gone back and forth in my thinking at times of, well, right. is it better to have that discipline or to go outside of it and so forth? And and that sort of um, humorous observation always always uh, kind of came to mind that even if the formula, you know, can help you inside, it, it's not like a, you don't necessarily have to do A before you do B. Um, yeah, um, so many things come to mind when you bring up the question of not being able to stage a fight, you know, or staging <laughs> a terrible fight. I, I don't know if you've ever seen, like, the old cowboy movies, like, from oh, sure, yeah, thirty-one. Those fight scenes are like, oh, this is different, you know, and your first, your first impulse is to say, what a crappy fight scene. <laughs> But the more you look at it, the more you realize that that those old fight scenes before they evolved, mm-hmm. shall we say, a formula for fight mm-hmm. scenes, they're much more realistic. They're much more yeah. the way people really pound away at each other. Fight scenes, as we believe, understand them, are choreography. Yes, yes, and that's a great so point. We have a we have a kind of an aesthetic issue here, you know, sort of I have nothing against choreography and the choreography of the Hong Kong fight scenes is delicious. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. it's so amazing, especially um, I'm thinking of a director, Johnny Toe. I don't know if you know him. I know the name, but I'm not sure if I've seen the, any of the films. Oh, he's deliriously fabulous. Um, and and uh, there's a, a movie uh, called The Mission, and the fight scenes there are transcendent. I mean, they're right on the same aesthetic level as ballet. Uh, they're, just, they're just brilliant, you know. But mm-hmm. what if that's not what you want to do? Mm-hmm. I, I'm not saying, well, okay, so, okay, La Ventura is no way about a fight scene, but still, what La Ventura is about is the inconclusiveness of the world. It fits right into the modernist, you know, um, storyteller. Um, and maybe you want a fight scene that's part of that aesthetic. Do you know what I'm saying? So yes, that and, it, and it can even be a natural. It doesn't even have to be uh, sort of like a calculation. It can be sort of a natural arising of the same instinct. Exactly. And itself in that in that situation. So maybe we don't want to say they're terrible fight scenes. Maybe we want to say they give us a different perspective on fighting. On the opening page of the book, you have a quote from Rilke, which is, uh, "Let everything happen to you, beauty and terror. Just keep going. Nothing is final." Do you think yeah. <laughs> that Cooper stops in this series? Is that his to the extent that such a multifaceted character and such a narratively uh, complicated universe can have an arc. Do you think that's where he ends up? Not not the audience necessarily, but that mm-hmm. his problem in this series is that he's he has stopped. He hasn't kept going. Well, that's really interesting. That's a beautiful question. Really beautiful. Um, okay. Um, one of the things that is, I'm going to reference you the the Elephant Man at the end, where mm-hmm. uh, the, the mother's voice says, "Nothing will die." And if you think about the end of Mulholland Drive particularly and the end of this where you're in a cul-de-sac existentially, um, but you can still hear sounds from somewhere else Mm -hmm. uh, that no matter what happens, no matter how final anything seems to be, nothing is final. Um, this this series ended there, and he is stuck. I mean, he's really stuck. And then he every the lights just seem to go out, right? And it's all darkness. But somewhere there's another parallel universe, I, I use that word very hesitatingly, mm-hmm. 
I think Lynch might use that word, but I, I use that word very uh, hesitatingly. There's another parallel universe where he hasn't stopped. And uh, it would be astonishing to know where he would go from here, Lynch. I, I, I never want to second-guess him, never. <laughs> um, but one thing that does seem continuous in his work is nothing is final. That's true. They found that out. Uh, I think it's it's funny to look back, even just in terms of Twin Peaks. In, I think, 2000, he said, Twin Peaks is dead as a doornail, and sort of didn't take his own advice, and look how that ended up. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> dead as a doornail. He also said, the film is dead. <laughs> yes, that's true. Hopefully that oh, was... Uh, well, He's not omniscient. He's just a great <laughs> artist. <laughs> uh, with the ending of that, uh, I think for me, in a weird way, it pointed back. Uh, well, okay, I'll ask you kind of an omnibus question here. Uh, for me, okay. the ending of the of season three somehow sort of pointed back in a way to Firewalk with me. That uh, that I think people have talked about Laura Palmer herself being kind of a structuring absence for the original seasons of Twin Peaks. And I feel at times, even though there is a lot of fire walk with me in the new series in various ways, that the film itself is kind of a, a bit of a structuring absence for, for season three in the sense that there's a lot of things that are both stylistically, narratively, thematically, in all sorts of ways are present in fire walk with me and kind of absent or only hinted at or viewed obliquely in in the third season. So for me, I guess I would say what Cooper is, where he's stopping, where he's not going, where he's not, where he's been diverted from is, uh, in a sense, firework, which is ironic because he actually literally enters into that movie in the at the end of part 17. He's literally interacting with the, the Laura, the shots from that film uh, presented in a very different way, which I think is significant. But so so oh, that for me oh, is, yeah, is one yeah, way I right I look at the season as this this sort of path you know the path less traveled I guess to quote another for us is uh, for me it has something to do with Firewalk with me for you the way you talk about it in the book it's um, you don't as you just said you don't like the second guest lynch and so for you it's more it seems the the open possibility but do you see could you put any specificity on what particularly the, on the path that Cooper is not going down, or do you think it, it must by necessity just remain sort of a, a unknown? Uh, no, I don't. I, I think anything is possible with Lynch. I mean, I don't know where his imagination would take him, but from the viewer's perspective though. Oh, from the viewer's perspective. I think I think viewers should I think people and me included um who are watching should uh deal with exactly what the artist has told them. I mean, if you're dealing with an artist, if you're dealing with, you know, murder she wrote, that's another story. Um but if you're dealing with an artist like Lynch, uh, I think what you're left with at the end is uh, this is the end, this is not the end. And that's all there is, unless he does another one. So I'm not I'm not interested in, in, in doing anything further than that. But I also want to, uh, in a very respectful way, um, Talk a little bit about the relevance of Fire Walk with Me yes, good. to season three. Mm -hmm. um, Fire Walk with Me is, from a production point of view, and from uh, uh, um a visionary point of view, very strange and interesting project. I think that, and th 
this is something that I have written about um, and, you know, could do more if I had to, if I felt like it. Uh, the, the thing about Firewalk With Me that is so extraordinary is the exit of the detective from the story and the transfer, which he did as a result. Now, here's a place yes. where production circumstances simply forced him to do it. Um, what's his face? Uh, McLaughlin walked out on him. Uh, and he right, couldn't. he did not want to be a big part of it. He didn't want to do it. Um, uh, I'm not coming in on anybody's side here. I don't want to be, you know, misunderstood at all. Uh, I don't know what happened, and I, I have nothing to say about his departure. Uh, but, I, but I mean, as a departure. But what I, I would say is that when do you ever see um, a movie or a television show, the mass media, and though David is an artist and an indie kind of guy, he is a part of the mass media. Uh, when do you when do you ever see it from the point of view of an abused woman? You see it from the point of view of a psychiatrist treating the abused woman. You see it from her best friend's perspective. You see it from her husband's perspective. You might even see it from her child's perspective. Or you see it from a policeman's or a detective's perspective. But when do you see it from the point of view of the abused woman herself? The reason for that is you want a male audience, and men don't want to identify with abused women, or they didn't. Now, I don't know what's going on now because, you know, all bets are off. So many things are going on. But certainly when when um, Fire Walk With Me came out and uh, when it was at Cannes, people got up and left and screamed and booed. I think it's a gender issue. I think men don't want to, or didn't, you know, men classically raised um, with classical uh, male identities, they don't they don't want to do that. It, that is not a good feeling at all. They will definitely identify with the detective in the movie Laura from the point <laughs> looking mm-hmm. at a dead girl uh, who turns out not to be dead. Um, right. Uh, fabulous movie. I love it. Um, they'll do that, but you don't want to do it from Laura's point of view, certainly not from the point of view of the corpse. Um, and the most amazing thing about that movie is that we do. Uh, Japanese women, uh, from what I understand from Ron Garcia, who was the DP on that movie, um, loved it. And they, went, they screamed with delight uh, because this is an identification that is very easy for them to make and... Um, um, gratifies them in many, many, many ways, some of them very healthy and some of them perhaps not, but I'm really not in a position to make that judgment. But, okay, this is a movie that grew out of um, an idea that David had and um, in the aftermath of a show where he lost creative control and you know what that means to him. Mm-hmm. And uh, under the circumstances that the guy he thought was going to be his hero wasn't going to be there. So I think it's I think it's a fascinating and and wonderful movie. And I've written very favorably about it. But I don't think it tells us anything about season three. And uh, I know that, and I say this with respect, and I don't mean to say that you are wrong. I'm just giving you my perspective. Um, I No, yeah. I mean, I, I, think, I think that, but I actually think that all the time about it. Uh, I question my, I'm aware, let's put it this way. I'm aware that for me, Firewalk With Me needs to be the center of Twin Peaks and that therefore I may be seeking out ways. But I think um, for me, one of the ways in which season three is most interesting as a part of Twin Peaks, which I would distinguish from 
interesting as a part of Lynch's canon and interesting as a part of the TV landscape. I think, okay. you know, there's there's different ways. For me, of course, of course. Uh, so far, the way that I've found it dialogues with Twin Peaks most compellingly is when I look for the ways in which it is uh, almost sort of an anti-fire walk with me and exists in it. Oh. Again, I, I obviously I'm a dialectical thinker because I keep doing this, but, uh, you know, looking at it as, as that as as kind of the absence of what which is everything you just said about it being the the female the the abused female's vision of what was initially presented as a detective story from the outside from a sort yeah. of male hero's point of view all of that sort of revelation and just also um for me they're different viewing experiences uh season 3 is a little closer to Early Lynch films, in a sense, I get a more sort of cerebral isn't exactly the right word. It's certainly not intellectual in in that sense, but like uh, more of like a, I guess you, you know go back to the the Nietzsche. It's it's more of an Apollonian experience, uh, Eraserhead, Elephant Man, uh, maybe not doing so much, but even Blue Velvet. And then the later Lynch films to me are more Dionysian. They're more visceral. I'm more immersed in it, and that begins and is never quite surpassed, I think, for me, with Firewalk with me. So That's in some ways, season three yeah. felt like a return to those that sort of earlier, a little bit more removed way of approaching art and looking at the world. And as such, as a part of Twin Peaks that has bits of Firewalk with me in it and around it, I suppose that's that's my... So, yeah, I don't know that I would say I believe Lynch was thinking about Firefly with me a lot as he created it, but as something that's inevitably entangled in some ways, I, I find it interesting to sort of tease out the ways that it, it does and doesn't uh, dialogue with it, if well, that makes I, sense. I, find what, I think what you're saying is extremely interesting. It seems to me that that in Firewalk with me, and I think you and I may be in fact saying the same thing, uh, Lynch was trying to take control of his story again. And when he came to do season three, uh, 25 years later, uh, it was a completely different situation. He's telling a, a very specific story about uh, an epic mission that fails and why it fails. Um, and he's also talking about the existence of evil um, in the world, which I think is an exceptionally big preoccupation of his. He's appalled by the suffering that he sees around him, personally appalled by the suffering that he sees around him, as I am. Um, and I think that he was really uh, telling that story. Now, what does Lynch mean in your perception by evil? Because that's often a loaded term that sort you of... Comes with certain connotations. Uh, how do you see his vision of evil? Non-being. The non-existence of Judy. Yeah, Judy is about non-existence, and and you know what's funny? This uh, I I don't think that this is at all present to him. But uh, I got my degree in English and American literature. I have a PhD in English and American literature, and I, I studied a lot of Renaissance stuff. And the, um, the, the concept of evil that we see in Renaissance stuff is uh, non-being, that evil doesn't actually exist. It's a negation of good. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I, see, uh, I see Lynch having that thought without, I don't think he's read <laughs> Renaissance literature. Maybe he has. I don't know. Uh, you never know. Um, but at the end of Othello, Iago says, I am not what I am. And uh, I think that about sums it up. That's what hmm. evil was in the Renaissance. Something that doesn't really exist. And you know when you think about it? <laughs> it feels true. Do you think that Judy is, in a sense, Maya, the Hindu concept? I don't know much about the concept of Maya. What are you thinking of? 
Well, I don't want to misrepresent it. My understanding, I mean, essentially the world that we live in is Maya. It's an illusion. Exactly. It's an illusion. No, 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 no. Uh, no, no that, that, okay. that, that would not be it. Um, what that is, is that the marketplace is an illusion. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, no, 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 no. And, and so, I suppose to a certain extent, there is uh, a predisposition for evil in the marketplace because there mm-hmm. is so much illusion. Uh, involved there, but I, I think the marketplace is a um, uh, the marketplace is a very um, complex business. I, I mean, you have Norma and Big Ed in the marketplace, and that's very beautiful. But they are very much creatures of the marketplace, right? Uh, so the marketplace is 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 uh, certainly capable of producing love um, as much as it is uh, capable of uh, producing deluded, self-destructive people like Fred Madison in uh, Lost Highway. So let's, I guess, extend on that a bit then. Um, the reason I asked if it was Maya was because I was thinking of sort of the, the the concept that evil is, as you said, sort of the, it doesn't really exist. It's the, it's the shadow in a way of, of, um, whatever standing between the all and the uh, between like brahman and not the, the between the 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 ego the individualized self and the actual state you know the unified field as lynch as lynch describes it um but it sounds like what we're talking about is something different so whatever I guess I so I'm sort of I I grapple a lot or struggle a lot with what Judy is and what she represents. Um, if it's a I she, the, I mean, look it, at the or it, look, yes. <laughs> look at the figure that emerges out of that glass box. It's neither you know. male nor female, but both. Right. Um, it really and, and it really is eerie and, and terrifying. And that's an interesting point because I've heard people kind of now that in the credits is described as experiment or experiment model I think in both part eight and part two and I certainly by the end of the show and many other people said okay well that's Judy that's the visualization of Judy and then I've heard other people go well no actually there's no reason to believe that it could just this could be two separate phenomena the idea of Judy and whatever this experiment model thing is but from your book it sounds like you're very confident in describing the experiment as as judy uh, is that something judy, is that yeah. from your own perception or did you talk with lynch about this at all I didn't. did you get anything no, from him that he wouldn't like me to ask that question <laughs> right well i assumed you didn't ask outright but i was wondering oh you mean yeah that was i sneaky um and i think i think you know i'm very very open to it might be judy it might not be judy and that that that's the sort of speculation that that is interesting to me and and I would certainly be open to that um but I think that uh that narratively it makes sense it does yeah that it is some form of Judy maybe there are billions of forms of Judy you know what I mean mm. uh because it seems to me that part 8 mm. when matter is decreated well that's a negation of being uh and that's what that looks like there. Mm. So maybe there are many, um, many um, manifestations of Judy. I, I would go with that, actually. I mean, mm-hmm. when you consider what all the rest of of the way I see all of this and what I understand of Lynch. I suppose experiment could be Judy entangled with matter in some sense because we first see it emerging in the mushroom cloud and then later in this glass box created by people that kind of trap something. So perhaps that's what Judy looks like when a part or whatever, <laughs> some aspect of Judy has become entangled with the with the material world. Maybe that, I mean, maybe I suppose that could lead us back. That's what it looks like when not being enters the marketplace. How about that? I love it. You know, it's beautiful. <laughs> but I like the um, I like the inconclusiveness of this part of our discussion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, why should Judy? I mean, come on, you know, sort of a red guy with uh, a tail and horns. Um, <laughs> it, 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 that 
that's very objectionable to me. I mean, it's it's fine uh, on a sort of low level, but if you're really getting serious about evil, uh, you know, the whole question of how many faces it has and how many, yeah, entering the marketplace decomposing the marketplace, <laughs> which is pretty much what happens at the White Sands, right? Yeah, exactly. And so, of course, yeah, the convenience inter- store this is, is interesting. This literally is a marketplace. And, and, you know, I think that conversation with Hawk, between Hawk and Sheriff Truman, yep. is very important. Yeah, you talked about how uh, the, the idea of um, putrefication of, of of, you know, the, the idea of putrefication connects both the scorched engine oil and the burned corn, burned fuel yeah, in a way. But also the question of the representation of evil. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, you know, how do you read this map is almost a lesson in poetry, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, David uses the word putrefication mm-hmm. um, a lot uh, to describe the degeneration of life and to me there's there's got to be an overlap with Judy or Jade can we I guess obviously non-being is a difficult thing to describe but (laughs) I mean would you be willing to sort of take a brief crack at just maybe expanding a little bit on what what that means in the in the context of Twin Peaks and in a more general context as well I mean it's not Death, I don't think it's no, something death else is a part of the that we're referring cycle. to. Yeah, death is a transition, isn't it? And uh, is it just know. lack of life force, lack of the higher well, state of consciousness, or or what exactly? Is I, defined I guess, yeah, it's so. right of you to push me on that. Well, it's it not it's even very... it's pushing myself too because I can't. I'm having. Sure. I have trouble wrapping. You know, getting getting a, a, a real sense of the of Judy and why it exists and why it needs to exist in the story. Right. Um, well, let's go to what I was saying about the reversibility of time and matter. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's possible that Jaude is built into, and this is a really interesting thing because then, and 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 it leads us to very complex questions about Lynch's work uh, and and about the vision of reality. Um, uh, really, there, it, there, time, time just, it turns back on itself. I mean, the implications of that are so extraordinary. Uh, matter is just, it's just a bunch of, of random um, particles that we think um, has you know have definite shapes, but at the bottom you know at the at the bottom is the bottomist <laughs> the um the most profound level of reality there is no shape it's all a soup of molecules um and time uh, time time moves this way it moves that way uh how can you pursue a goal? What does it mean to pursue a goal? What does it mean to do anything in the marketplace if time cannot go forward smoothly, if it turns back on itself? And when it turns back, you're, uh, you're, you're in an opposite universe from where you started. If you think about that, that in itself could be a description. And we're getting really, mm-hmm. really... Um, deep, if you like, uh, about being and non-being. That in itself yes. could yeah. be a description of non-being. That Jaude, and here's, I mean, isn't this something that you don't want to think? That Jaude is simply built into the nature of the universe. It's a possibility. Yeah. And what does, what does that do to the concept of the hero? He isn't there yet. In uh, in Twin in Twin Peaks season three, he isn't, uh, but he's moving in in a direction yeah. that could go there. Think about time and space. What happens to them in in season three? Which is why I don't really see it uh, 
Oh, well, never mind. I don't want to do that. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, I mean, and you you have really um, pushed me uh, in a wonderful way. I, I mean, this is what I live for. Um, you, you've you pushed me to go a lot further than I went in the book. Um, but anybody reading the book, it would be interesting for them to read with this part of the conversation mm-hmm. that we're having in mind, uh, that we are looking at the possibility that the entire Western concept of hero and villain and good and evil is mythological, that, you know, really evil is built into the framework of the universe just as good is. You don't eradicate it, but what do you do about it? Big question. Nobody is ever going to solve that one in my lifetime. Did Lynch, when you spoke with him, use the word evil, either in reference to Judy or just in general? I'd have to look at my notes. I don't remember. No, yeah. ju- it, no, Judy, no. Uh, no. Judy for now, okay. Because no, it's interesting, and, and that's one thing, I guess, that I was interested to hear you talk about, because, and, and that you did, and that what we just spoke, because it's hard for me, whenever I hear the word evil brought up with a Lynch film, I get kind of uncomfortable, because I'm like, okay, that, and just because of the connotations of it and everything, it's a, you know, it, it very, it's very dualistic in a way that I sometimes, well, and certainly in your descriptions of his work, good I felt... Point. Yeah. sort of pushes against. Mm. Um, but it, this brings to mind something interesting that uh, the critic Marion Bale wrote on Twitter after um, oh, yeah. Part 17 and 18 aired, where we were talking about uh, Judy and what, she, and, and I was sort of resisting the idea that a lot of people had, of like, this is the new big bad of Twin Peaks. Like, you know, <laughs> Bob was a minion, but Judy is like the actual. And I was like, I it just doesn't do that much for me. And she pointed out, Marion Bale pointed out that, uh, in the description of Judy, Gordon Cole does not use the word evil with that. He says negative, which is, negative and she is. says negative, which is the, an opposite, uh, I can't, I'm paraphrasing, but she's pointed out it's like the opposite current from pos- electrical current of positive. Correct. And that was okay. That's what I and you use. You talk about that in the book as well. Yeah. 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 Well, she, uh, David, David really, um, David is quite concerned about negativity quite concerned about negativity. And uh, it's interesting, too, because at some place in the cosmos, there is pure good, Um, the unified field. What's at the center of the unified field is consciousness. And as far as he's concerned, that's pure good. So this concept of negativity, and I think that, yeah, I think she's right, Uh, I think that um, uh, electricity, um, in, and you, you remember um, the little man from another place saying electricity, you know, and rubbing his hands. Mm-hmm. So he, he's been doing this for a while. And, you know, electricity shows up all over the place in his work, certainly in, in a racer head, you know, and all that energy is, is uh, released when... Uh, Henry kills or dismembers anyway um, the thing that's called the baby. Right. Um, uh, yeah, ne- negativity and positivity. And Judy, Judy, Jaude or Judy is, uh, yeah, it's the negativity. Um, and the whole question of, but it's really hard. To, how do we talk about what's positive in in uh, season three, electricity is his poetic metaphor for mm-hmm. talking. Uh, instead of saying good and evil, so yeah, probably I misspoke and should not use that term. Well, it has it is, huge Judeo-Christian baggage, right? Yes, right, exactly. And his work to me, um, and you know, there's I think there's interesting work that is quite dualistic, but I always kind of see his as, you know, going beyond that more to the point that we were talking about. I mean, really the the sort of the Hindu uh, tradition that the transcendental meditation arises out of 
sure. um, which is this, uh, you know, the the idea that there is the unified field, the all, and that in a sense any negativity would somehow be either a part of that or an illusion. Or, well, you know, we're getting back into that. Yeah, but. no, I, I like <laughs> I like that that option that negativity yeah. is an illusion because uh, because consciousness isn't that. Exactly. And consciousness and is is life. Honestly, that's another reason that I didn't even mention that I look at this season in relation to fire walk with me because i think the closest we get to a positive transcendent uh vision in twin peaks is laura with the angel at the end of fire walk with me and it somehow feels to me that no matter what he comes up with later and whatever else that still feels like the ending of twin peaks in some fundamental sense not chronologically or whatever but that's somehow no, I where, hear what you're saying. However, where we're left so when i watch yeah, whenever I watch the end of season three, I don't think this is it. This is the ending. Now, I think he's reminding us that we already saw the ending and that Cooper isn't there yet. <laughs> if yet has any meaning in this, in this chronology. Oh, of course. Is it future or is it better? Yeah. Uh, so also the negative. I kind of sorry, have no. a... Mm, I'm suspicious of that angel. Um, think about where other angels are. The angel in the little portrait, the little sentimental port uh, pictures in Laura's bedroom and the sentimental pictures in John Merrick's bedroom in the in the elephant man um i no no i i this i think i i you know i very clearly diverge from you in this no 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 the end of uh, and that and the ending of um fire walk with me well that was a very difficult it was very difficult for him to find the ending. Clearly, he had yes, lots right. of endings in mind for that. And you know, the when she sees the angel, mm. I think the angel is secondary, though. I don't think the angel is the center of the scene. What do you think it is? I think her face is the center of the scene. Uh-huh. I think the suspension and of I the don't body think and she's space necessarily is even reacting. That. I don't think she's necessarily even. Uh, just reacting. So I think the angel is important. It's a it's a that's a thematic continuity or a motif that he actually wasn't in the script and that was added. Uh, my understanding is thanks to conversations between him and Cheryl Lee about the props that they used and what they meant to her. Like her whole line about the angels go away was was you know they came up with that on the on the set itself. And, so they didn't uh, go away. The angel didn't go away. Right, oh, and Ron Garcia has there. some sort of interesting uh, uh, thoughts about that. But yeah, so anyways, I mean, I I, uh, I don't want to go too much down that that uh, that uh, that thread at the moment because I had another um, well, but direction. And just, actually, or no, sorry, keep going. Yeah, finish, uh, finish, it's just because a very, process. very, very brief thing, you know, sort of that the ending was already um, at the end of Fire Walk with Me, or or is the ending at the end of uh, Twin Peaks season three? But there is no end. That's what I want to impress on on this conversation. That for Lynch, there's never an end. So no, I don't think that. I, I think you might want to think a little bit more about your idea that you know what it impresses on us is that we've already seen the ending because there isn't any. I would say uh, what I mean by end is not uh, punctuation necessarily, but uh, well, what she says in the Between Two Worlds where he interviews uh, the three actors, the Palmer actors, and they perform in character, uh, which I guess he wrote that morning and brought, had delivered to, to the, like he was just going to interview them as actors. And uh, he had his assistant send over a little script and had them memorize it in like an hour before they shot it. He has Cheryl Lee say, and then I saw what it was, and it was so beautiful, I was awake. And that, to me, is what it is. It's, it's not a moving from left to right. It's a moving up out of the up, framework yeah. of the narrative. Uh, up is the motion. Like, it's the right. end in the sense that the unified field is the end. It's not the end. It's just the... It's the summa. <laughs> it's uh, sure. <laughs> there we go. It's, it's the uh, it's the source of all life, you know, right? Sure. It's everything. That's what he says. 
Um, and there is, what of course, the... a prologue that says, uh, you know, the all, and and once you get, once once you got to the all, you're everywhere, and yes, you know, which, which of course is another religious concept from the Renaissance. Um, but yeah, okay, let's leave that where we we've got it. Oh, <laughs> sure, we will. <laughs> because I like this conversation so very much. <laughs> what were you going well, to ask next? I guess is that's the positive, and the negative is the current in the opposite direction. I wanted to bring up the uh, the figure of the jumping man, which is extremely yeah. peripheral in season three, and yet every time we see it, it's very much tied into something, certainly Sarah Palmer, and... Um, I think Judy as well, uh, although that's a little more speculative on my part. But so the little, well, there's a lot loaded. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. Um, but so when Cooper goes up the stairs, this is what made me think of it, in the convenience store in part yes. 17, yes. Uh, the jumping man is shown descending the stairs, going in the opposite direction. Yes. So right there you have the sort of the opposite currents. And then, of course, there's all the, uh, you see the jumping man's face stretched out over Sarah when she takes her face off. To bite the man in the bar, you see the oh, nose God. pop poke out scene. really quickly. Oh, I know, <laughs> it's incredible. Um, and then also, there's the question of the little girl. So, but do you see the little girl as Sarah Palmer? Because that's obviously a point of contention. Well, it's not Zippo, actually a point of no, contention. No, nada, it's, never. <laughs> do you feel? So did you sad. talk to Lynch about that at all? Out of no, out of no, curiosity, no. no. Do you think? I, I, I he, don't talk to him about things like that. He doesn't like it. Do you I mean, have any like, speculation? He doesn't about like you to say what there? does that mean. Sure. He, he says it's there. The, oh, there's enough information there. He would say to you, enough information there. So would you say either way that you think he does or doesn't believe that, or is interested in it, or so, or or anything like that, or do you? Um, I think I have got a lot more to think about about part eight. You know, I think. Yeah. Um, um, I, did I mention to you? I'm pretty sure I didn't. I've just been given a. Um, a contract for a new book um, oh, by the University of Texas Press, and I will be I will be talking about uh, season three in that book. Ah, Not nice. exclusively. I've been talking yeah. about a lot of things in that book, but I will be talking about se- uh, season three. And I do want to think about part eight, and I do want mm. to think about that uh, those, those kids and and the and the entrance into that little girl. Okay, if I were going to make a correspondence about um about the little girl and something else in Lynch I would talk about the old Polish folktale old Hungarian folktale by the first visitor in Inland Empire hmm. where she says a little girl went out to play you know a little yeah. boy went out to play and saw his shadow evil was born so right. we got that word there uh, and then a little girl went out to play and, and uh, you know, sort of something behind the marketplace, I think. Um, but in any case, it, uh, I really, really think that it's not Lynch's way to... Is it not Lynch's to, way to... Okay, sorry. Keep to going. be that simplistic. This you, is her when she was a little girl. Oh, no, no, no. Give me a break. Um, no, definitely not. Do you I mean, think what we, we have youth. We have innocence. We, I mean, that's yeah. where I would start working on it. I, I didn't talk much about that in the book or at all. I don't think I, I said a word about it. I can't remember if it was as I was watching it or soon after, but definitely that whole speech that, of course, another you know character played by Grace Zabriskie, <laughs> Uh, in Inland Empire oh, is about God, the little girl that. and all of that. And, and uh, there was just something extremely archetypal about it. And for me, it's that is it's an interesting point because I think it's, – it's, how would I put this? To me, I don't – I have no problem believing – I mean, Frost asserts a lot of things in his book, Final Dossier, where, of course, he says that that girl was Sarah – and um, right, <laughs> you love that book. Excuse me, I'm just going to go and vomit. I'll be back. Go ahead. And uh, see, he asserts a lot of things, or he speculates about. Sometimes he doesn't assert, but he says, "Well, this is what this could be," and so forth. 
the way he presented the thing and also the way he presented it in Q and A's leads me leads me to suspect he discussed it with Lynch, which does not mean that Lynch. I'm not talking about after the you know while writing the book. I mean during the process of creation, um, which does not mean that Lynch agreed necessarily, but it seems like something that Frost felt fully confident saying this was something we came up with. What it well. seems to me is whether <laughs> whether or not that's the case, whether or not he said it or he just thought it and yeah. didn't say it aloud and Lynch had his own conclusion, I think there's a reason Lynch doesn't say it in the episode, and it's not just to be mysterious, per se. It's because everything you're saying about it, starting with the questions of, um, you know, of... of Innocence and corruption, and uh, the—I I can't remember what was the other thing that you just you just pointed out about that about the the girl, like where where you would want to start with that. Um, it just seems like by not identifying it as a particular character, it retains or evokes that um, universal—not universality, but the sort of allegorical nature as well. It, it doesn't not tied down to one thing all i would say i guess because i don't i do kind of see her as being sarah and i don't really have a problem i find it helpful even in some ways to think that but i would analogize it with you know the question of keeping laura palmer's murderer mystery at least initially um or not laying out a certain i don't know uh it seems to me that something can be both um, but maybe it can't. I don't know. It's it's it seems to me that uh, it's possible for that to be a particular character and to relate to her story, and also to be able to be a more universal, abstract, not universal, but a more more of an abstraction as well. Does that make any sense? No. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does. Um, yeah. Of course, it does. But uh, okay, the thing is. But he doesn't like naming things. We know it's that. It's very trivial. It's very trivializing. Much like believing that that um, little old Audrey got out of her coma and went to beauty school. Mm. Um, there's something about. I mean, I, I find myself just a little bit at a loss for words because it it's so trivializing. Um, and so contrary to the spirit of everything that Lynch is, um, we have uh, creation and decreation in uh, in part eight. We have counting backward. You know, we have the nine inch nails. We have. Um, Mr. C uh, being shot and revived. There's so much in Part 8 that you can relate uh, that interlude with the little girl, uh, the teenage girl or early teenage girl and the boy to that seems so much more appropriate. I can't think of a single reason why that little girl should be read as Sarah, except that Sarah is very mysterious and people are frantically grabbing at ways to interpret her, which is not the best way to look at Lynch. I think, um, yeah, I definitely, I mean, actually it's funny because what you're saying reminds me in a way of when I first watched Firewalk with me and I watched it after Twin Peaks, so I went to it with all the Twin Peaks baggage, but uh, the story of Laura was so powerful to me that I actually resented the presence of the mytholo- any mythology that was still in the film and, hmm. and felt it was a flaw and that it kind of dragged it down to be having the Red Room and the Little Man and uh, all of the, and Bob as like an inhabiting spirit and all of this stuff when it was really this powerful story of this one person and their experience. Now, over time, I think I came to sort of integrate it more and see more. Of, I, I still understand that impression and why I had it. And I wouldn't even say it was wrong necessarily, but 
I've come to sort of a different vantage point viewing it, and I think I see this the question of the little girl and Sarah somewhat similarly in the uh, sense that it has a toe in both worlds. It has a toe in something more universal, and, well, more than a toe, but, you know, it has, it, it's part of something that can't be pinned down, and it also has a part that can be, if not pinned down, put within a certain framework um, while still having that the, the part that opens out to something bigger. Um, well, of course, I think that's, are, that's an aesthetic I think are, possibility. Yeah. I mean, it's not that that can't happen. And also, I'll say, if it's something, I I think if it's something you get from the book, from the dossier, and that's how it first sort of comes into your consciousness, then that's probably not, and I don't know if that was the case with you or if you'd heard people speculated about beforehand, but that's probably... Because yeah, the way the way that it's done in the book is very sort of on the nose. Um, I think for me, watching it and wondering at a certain point, oh, you know, is it, there's there's interesting connections. So I do think there are. Um, you raise an interesting point because, on a fundamental sense, in a fundamental um, some fundamental regard, the little girl doesn't need to be Sarah, and Sarah doesn't need to be the little girl. Like it doesn't produce and it doesn't necessarily produce any greater understanding of either of them for that to be the case and i think that's a point well taken i do think there are definite textual uh ideas and clues that exist uh that do tie the two together so for one thing she's she has uh, she she makes a comment uh about knowing where the boy lives and he's kind of surprised that she knows that which seems to relate directly to Sarah's, uh, you know, occasional psychic gifts. There's also... Well, she says, I just know things, right? I just know things, exactly. Okay, do you remember any other character in any Lynch movie who has ever said that? That they just know things? I just know things. How do you know that? I just know. It rings a bell, but who are you, who are you thinking Sandy in of? Blue Velvet. Ah, there you go. You remember? <laughs> Uh, I do now, okay. yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is something that That's girls say to boys. Yeah. This is something that girls say to boys within sure. the Lynchian um this is very feminine as far as David is concerned. And I would Obviously. also say that the Jeffrey Obviously. family relationship with Blue Velvet I think is a huge um I'm sorry, I, I, you, you broke up. Say that Oh, sorry, again. I was going to say the Jeffrey Sandy relationship in Blue Velvet, for obvious, very obvious casting reasons, uh, but many, but other reasons as well. And I think you just pointed out another area where it comes to play, I think is a huge, um, I don't know what, I, I wouldn't say reference point. It's not that mechanical, but a huge touchstone for season three, I think. You think? Yes. I think the Diane Cooper scenes in part 18 are uh, quite powerful on their own, but there's mountains more resonance to them in relation to Blue Velvet. Well, I'll have to think more about that. I'm not even sure I could articulate it in this particular no, way. That's, just the idea that it's going through I mean, it's certainly 30 years later in a, in a, such a painful kind of encounter, I think, for me, had a lot of resonance. Well, if you're going to do an intertextual reading of his work... Yes, uh, it, 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 it has obvious reasons, but there's no reason to talk about Sarah and the little girl. Right, except right. For, yeah, yeah. Except Back for nervousness. <laughs> you know, sort of, okay, what the hell is Sarah doing? Oh, wait a second. Could that be Sarah? You know, um, and it it's bad reading and it's it's bad discipline and we have so much of that going on <laughs> you know uh in it, it, among the people who are doing something that i consider to be really valuable and that is thinking about great works on television and that's such a wonderful thing and and i don't really want to um i really don't want to see that end but we need more discipline in the way we do it. A lot of the thinking, I mean, there's so many people who say, I just watch it, don't ask me about it, you know, um, which is not healthy. Um, but 
people are saying, yeah, I'm interested and I want to know what this means. And I think that's wonderful and I encourage it, you know, 100%. But there's so little discipline among some people who kind of, uh, they get their own hobby horses and they refuse to think further about applying what they want to be true to the movie. So I think yes. Sarah, no, I do. I agree Sarah with that. Little Girl is is a I mean I, I mean let's let's sort of if if you if you would just indulge me a second, sure, go back sure. to the the Polish folk tales. I mean, what the hell are they doing in that scene anyway? It seems to me that the little Polish folk tales are not insinuated into that scene because they're talking about any particular character, but for some other reason, which, quite frankly, I don't know. Um, I mean, that's stuff that I continue to think about. As I say, there's no end, no, no end to um, talking about Lynch. Um, I would say that the little girl, the innocence of the little girl being infiltrated by that very strange creature who is very much associated with uh, both the decreation of matter in um, in the atomic countdown and uh the the woodsman well um, and the jumping man which is why i think people see, the sometimes jumping man that you've introduced go down that to me. Uh, i path. never think about it never well, think about that uh, it's it's literally a jumping creature, and it has a long nose. Well, that's the, uh, true. The jumping man does. <laughs> so that's why. So here's the thing. I, I get what you're saying, and I think when I reviewed, because I reviewed these episodes the night they aired, I, not reviewed, but I wrote down my thoughts Commented, and yes. sort of commented upon. Yeah, I wrote like long essays of just what it, what was on my mind at the time. Right. And uh, I think I might have even said that I that part of me hoped it wasn't any character that we'd seen because there was something powerful about it. Is as uh, on that, you know, it, it being disconnected almost in a way. I mean, at one point I almost kind of saw it as like <laughs> like the Twin Peaks is her dream almost, you know, and that was kind of beautiful in itself. Like I this am so is hostile sort of... to that interpretation. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I, yeah, not in a literal sense that like she wakes up like Dorothy, but, he, you know, he, that there's, yes. that there's, that somehow she's, uh, that, that, that there's that kind of, nesting going on there i don't know there's something poetic about that there's something poetic about the idea of it just being somebody apart from all of this other story that has its own i mean there's something appealing honestly about seeing part eight like i wanted to see Firewalk with me when i first saw it as something outside of the twin peaks hmm. universe that can escape the sort of um you know some of the more well dare i say it's formulaic uh you know, accoutrements that are still still cling to Twin Peaks as a whole. Um, but I do think it is it's still something of both. There's both that there's both are present there. And um I you know, and then again this is the question of Lynch and Frost and who wrote what and how, you know, some of which we'll never know. But there may be cross purposes or at least different vantage points working within the text itself as well. Um, what do so you I'll think leave it about? That. Yeah, <laughs> what do you what? I mean, we've turned up enough enough, you know, soil uh, to make it interesting, you know, to put some oxygen into the soil for something to grow. Um, so I think I think that that's that's a good conversation. But just as a matter of personal um, curiosity, since I have you here, uh, what do you make of the Speech by uh, by Lucy and Andy's son, <laughs> Wally Brando. Sort of, yeah. I found I found it hilarious when I watched it. Um, I don't know in, in in any is there a larger context that you can uh, relate it to or, or find some sort of resonance in in the work. Uh, at the moment, I can't think of any. There might be if I if I uh, tangled I with it a little more. But just as a standalone scene, uh, it 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 really uh, 
struck me as, as Cooper says, it struck me as funny. Well, I just, I'm just not going to comment on it as a standalone scene because it's not important. But, um, but as a part of Twin Peaks, I thought it was the most extraordinary false note I have ever seen in in Lynch. More so than the Bob Ball. Pardon? More so than the the, the giant ball with Bob in it and the gold, the green glove. Oh, totally not. It. <laughs> no, no, totally not. I kind of see what's going on there. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I see it as um, working as ridiculous, that it's right. supposed to be ridiculous. And there's reasons for it. Uh, and, you know, sort of does yes, it work? I agree. Or... I agree totally with that. I didn't see it. But... I... Yeah, sorry. Keep going. No, no, finish your sentence. I was just going to say, we talked in the past about episode 16, the Leland death one, and how I have a lot of problems with that episode. And, uh, you know, and and uh, your actually more favorable impression of it was kind of interesting to me because it gave me another perspective on it. But I saw the Bob thing, Glove thing as almost a parody of that because Lynch did not, um, you know, was not directly involved with that episode, which brought the Laura mystery to an end. And this seemed like it took that general idea of battling evil but put it pushed it so far over the top that it became like consciously ridiculous and kind of funny in that way. Um and part of the whole anti heroic thrust yes. of Lynch. Right. Exactly. Uh which I mean, is, even within the text Cooper doesn't do anything. He just stands there and watches the other guy. Well isn't that really interesting <laughs> that Cooper is not handed the role of beating Bob up? I think I think that is so crucial to everything that's going on here. Um that Lucy, I mean look at who look at who does these things. Lucy shoots Mr. C. Lucy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean it could so easily have been our hero. I am the FBI. Um and and obviously the whole question of her, the heroic within uh, the universe as Lynch is constituting it. However, I see nothing in that that speech of the guy on the motorcycle. I don't believe Lynch wrote it, and I can't believe he let it into the the episode. And I'm almost tempted to ask him about that, and I might. (laughs) My understanding is Frost definitely wrote that scene, but Lynch uh, was the one who cast Michael Sarah in the part for okay. whatever that's worth. Well, that well, it's worth something. Um it's certainly <laughs> I mean, it's it's you've got some evidence for it obviously. Um but and you know, I I can't believe I couldn't believe that Lynch could write that thing. Uh I would believe that. Trump no, that was a Mark Frost speech. Frost wrote sure. it. Um and I don't know why. Uh <laughs> I have no idea why he wrote it. I have no idea why it's there. Um, I guess you figured out. I don't think it's funny. Right, right. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a very divisive scene. <laughs> not that anybody cares. I mean, my personal opinions that are just a matter of taste and temperament are really irrelevant. The opinions that I think are worth listening to are the ones that are based on some kind of important textual analysis or research or, um, you know, understanding of the production circumstances or of Lynch. I mean, that means something to me. This doesn't. It's just, I remember I remember the feeling of betrayal that I felt when, <laughs> when that thing came on the screen. I thought, no! Uh, but, um, but it's interesting. Well, uh, you talk about false notes. One of the interesting uh, something to me I don't think was played quite as obviously as a self-conscious self parody as the as the green glove bob ball thing, but also felt false to me and I was surprised the extent to which everybody embraced it as sort of a sincere moment is what you just said, Cooper popping up out of bed and saying, I am the FBI and ordering J- Janie around and now he's like this, you know, the the full on hero again. Like to me, that was somewhat ambiguous but i had to read it as ironic or else i would not have liked it like it is a straightforward thing i don't think it works i completely agree with you and of course he is 
what the uh, perfect hero looks like within a Lynchian context. Ridiculous. That brings us to Dougie. Your read on that seems to be negative in terms of what that character has to offer or um, what their role is in the narrative, that it's just sort of a comical cul-de-sac. And it's interesting because I've I've never come to a definitive conclusion about that, that character or that storyline, but I've seen different interpretations which have resonated with me at different times. Um, you know, one of which is, yes, just it. the point is his sort of impotence and his, his, he's stuck in this little, you know, the only things he can do are these sort of silly material things like give the Mitchum brothers a big a check or, uh, you know, help help this lady win all her money back so her son's like, who would want to talk to their son if they left you because you were homeless? I mean, just, exactly. <laughs> why is she so happy about it? You know, it, it, <laughs> it, it, it seems very satirical in that sense, but it's but played in a sort of a is it or isn't it kind of way. But then I've also heard, um, you know, other interpretations that in a sense this is, he's almost like a little Buddha and that <gasps> he is his, this is his like, uh, this is almost Lynch's, uh, version, the version of Cooper that he thinks is kind of, uh, uh, or, you know, maybe shouldn't put it in terms of what he thinks, but this is a version of Cooper that is presented as at least being somewhat, um, I don't know if ideal is the word, like they present it in a goofy, disarming way, but in a sense, this is actually what Cooper should be, is this sort of pure receptacle, well, receptacle sounds like a trash can, but the pure receptacle <laughs> for the universe of just taking in what's offered to him, enjoying it. Any of the people who are who interpret him as a Buddha, as a person innocently taking from the world and making something of it, I bet they liked Forrest Gump. <laughs> I, I'll have to ask them. <laughs> I, I bet they I did. I would suspect not in this particular case. But, well, you may yeah. be surprised. Uh, <laughs> Because, in fact, he is incapable of giving back anything except an imitation of what somebody has already given him. Um, I, there's absolutely nothing in um, the way Dougie is presented that um, that has any resonance of... Um, the kind of receptivity that uh, that Lynch really loves, Cooper, in season one, mm-hmm. is receptive. That is, he, he is a person who is... I mean, he, one of the things that, that Lynch has made very clear to me and uh, is very important to me and, was, and really helped my development as a critic is... Uh, the tension, I don't know if he'd use that word, but I'm going to use it, between um, receptivity and the values that we learn from culture. You have to be an active person. You have to Mm -hmm. be a person who actively works between where you came from and where you're going. Um, that, That receptivity given that, you know, you come from the culture that we come from, has to be something that you open yourself up to, not that you helplessly can't do anything else. Um, There's no mutuality in Dougie. There's no receptivity in Dougie, because to be receptive, you have to be active. Um, You have to be an active intelligence and an active sensibility, and he isn't, and he is Manufactured. How well, anybody can gloss over that? I do not. Not, not know. the one who comes out of the uh, socket. That's Cooper. Yeah, it's kind of. You know, when right, you he's are, a frazzled Cooper, but, but he's, he's not very fra- he's, he's diminished. not the one who, who shows up in the red room and gets disintegrated. Um, but no, he was a manufacturer. Uh, and and the other one that Cooper orders. That's manufactured. Right, that one is that, yes, she's, the that one she's so happy that about. <laughs> so Cooper, as a person who is incapable of thought or response or intuition or initiative or learning, um, is 
uh, you know, the thought that that person could be ideal makes me weep for anybody who <laughs> thinks it. Now, you know that I haven't said that about, you know, somebody. If you've, you've given me competing ideas, and I haven't said anything yeah. like this. But in this case, it really does make me weep for anybody who could possibly think that this was an idealized form of Cooper. I think the reason that, like, I, I, some of you, some of the things you're saying were for me, because there was one point where I thought maybe if I rewatch the series, I'll find that somehow the the sort of the heart of the series in some way is sort of hidden within the Dougie stuff. And I rewatched it, and I didn't feel that way <laughs> for some of the reasons that you're saying. Um, like there just there was there, there wasn't enough. I don't know, but. I will say the reason that I even would humor those ideas in the first place and that I found some resonance with them is I think the oftentimes when I will hear people go in that direction, the idea is not so much that it's his that, – that he is he is not – you know, okay, so I, I presented it to you as a receptacle for the universe, and that's one one form that was presented, but I also heard people present it in the a sense that he's there, he just can't communicate. That he is his he's there's there's a presence and a consciousness within that that figure. There's like a humanity there that um either isn't communicating because they can't or isn't compelled to, to communicate um, but perhaps that's reading too much into it. I don't know. Well, you, I mean, everything is reading, but um, let's let's just ask ourselves the question: uh, What happens when he's uh, said, or he desperately feeds himself energy? Everything that's been missing is is there. I mean, Dougie has no energy. He has no energy of his own, and we we know that for Lynch, and energy is everything. But he does have curiosity. No curiosity. You don't think so? See, okay, so that's where? what I'm not sure about. <laughs> where does he well, have he's fascinated curiosity? Fascinated by the world without. He's fascinated by the statue, by the Only coffee, what, no. by. Oh, he isn't. It just reminds him of of mm-hmm. something that he can't connect to. The Maybe. statue reminds well. The statue reminds him of you know, yeah. the badges. I mean, he's sure. trying to recall that he's an FBI man. That and is that's the, fir- that's the first thing that he says. Yeah. And the red heels are recalling Audrey. You know, I mean, he's trying to remember. Um, okay. No, no, he isn't curious. He's incapable uh, of going, curiosity. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to now switch places a little bit with you and say. I'll look at Dougie a little bit the way that you were looking at the girl who, who the little girl, and say, uh, yes, of course, we know Dougie is Cooper, unlike the little girl, you know, but I think there's a possibility. I'll go to Lynch directly on this. He did say when he was talking about Dougie and what he found interesting about the character, there was a conversation about him being like an infant between him and the interviewer, and he said uh, it's that process of coming into the world and discovering the things you like and finding something. So I would submit that it's possible for that to work on several levels, one of them being that he's longing to become Cooper again, and another one being more allegorically that we're all longing to become something that we could be or are, and that there is a genuine sense of curiosity and engagement and sensation there. I think it's... um very nice the way you entertain many different ideas and and think about them. I really I'm seriously saying that. It's it's a big um commendation. Not everybody can. It's true. Do you think that TV we've talked about how Lynch has changed TV. Do you think TV changed him as well? His work, his working methods, the types of stories he told and uh do you and and within that um you can consider both the way that the sort of negative uh constrictions of the industrial environment did so and also and i don't think this is necessarily a totally separable phenomenon the way that mark frost's own differing sensibilities and method of working also had both a negative and a positive uh impact on him post twin peaks do you see that real, that sort of Mark hasn't flow had in any, that direction? Mark hasn't had any impact on him. Um, I, he has to deal with Mark. 
and, and I am not. Please, everybody, if this is a podcast, <laughs> wherever it winds up on paper or you know digital, uh, Lynch has never, ever spoken to me about his relationship to Mark Frost, and if he did. He would have nothing but nice things to say about him. I I do not hear. I've never heard Lynch badmouth a colleague. Absolutely never. Um, and if anything I said ever were to be misconstrued as saying that he badmouthed someone, he would be furious, um, <laughs> and he would be right to be furious. So, okay, everything I say about uh, whether Mark has. Um, um, impacted David or what their relationship was like or this incredibly fabulous question that you have asked me, which I consider to be something that maybe this is a you know growing point for me, uh, has television changed David? I mean, working in that media, mm-hmm. has it changed David? Uh, this is all about my firsthand observation of Frost, which is quite limited, my extensive um, observation of Lynch, which is reasonably extensive, and my um, my knowledge somewhat of who contributed what to mm-hmm. the um, to the series. So, I mean, everything I say in response to your question, it, this particular question, is about me and what I've observed. I, as I observe it, Mark has not impacted. David at all in his artistry. Um, Certainly, uh, David had a problem, um, as I have said, uh, you know, in a number of venues uh, when he came back to Twin Peaks at the end and threw away the last script, which um, Frost uh, wrote with Bob Engels. Um, But it didn't change David. It gave David a um, an artistic problem to solve. He had to finish Twin Peaks, restoring his vision to the show, but things had appeared on screen, and they had to have some relationship to what he did at the end. So that's as far as, as I would say, um, Mark's work. Um, don't think it has impacted Lynch at all. Whether television has changed Lynch, I don't know. I've never thought about it. And and you can say to me, uh, what? You never thought about that? That's a basic question. And you'd be right. Uh, I'm completely fascinated by the question, and I will be talking to him. Um, and you, I think I, I think he would be willing to discuss that with me. You know, there are many things he won't discuss, but I think he'd be very interested to discuss that question. So I'll get back to you on that one. Well, yeah, I'd definitely be curious to hear uh, his own his own sort of thoughts and responses on that. I, I think for me, I guess to clarify, I do see an impact uh, both from the industrial conditions and from the, I would say the industrial conditions plus entangled with Frost's own sensibility about how the story should be pursued. The way I look at how Frost impacted Lynch, uh, or let's say impacted uh, Twin Peaks itself, um, first of all, I think there's a there's a what I would describe as more of a purely positive uh, aspect. This is definitely a difference in perception of Twins. I do not see season one, aside from the episodes Lynch directed, uh, which were only two of the eight, as being at all um, particularly Lynchian. In fact, I would say that's probably, from my understanding, from the working conditions and, and the context that I've been able to, to sort of perceive there, uh, that that was actually Frost's most, one of his most heavily involved points with the show, uh, where he was basically running the ship in, in some ways by himself, you know, off of a story that he and Lynch had created, but really working in season out. season one? Yes. I think it's probably the strongest stretch of the series, particularly the later half, which has no Lynch episodes, but from like, say, the fourth to the seventh episode, depending how you number them, I think is one of the few points where Twin Peaks seems like a cohesive week-to-week t- TV show that's telling this ongoing story and 
showing this larger universe in a, you know, sort of balancing the, the two poles. So I think that's a, a positive contribution of, of Frost, and I think there are things like that throughout the series. Then I think there's what I would call the purely negative. Um, I think things like Wyndham Earl, uh, a lot of the season two developments, which were very much Frost doing, um, really did not uh, help the show Overall, I do, I will say at this point, after studying the show for years, find them fascinating. Like, I I kind of have come to a point where I perversely am as interested in the weakest parts of the series as the best, just because there's this question <laughs> of, like, how can these things exist in the same world? Like, how can a Nickelodeon subplot about Nadine tossing people in the air be on the same show as this, you know, <laughs> like, Blue Velvet-esque examination of violence. Like, it just fascinates me. So I'm, in a perverse way, I'm almost glad that's there now. But I think objectively, right. those are not strong contributions to the show. And then I think, for me, most interesting is the area where uh, it's almost what I would call, like, negative transmuted into positive, where he made a decision, often for the wrong reasons, that had huge ramifications for the show and forced Lynch to come in and... Uh, put his own spin on them. And the point I'll make here is I don't think, so the strongest points of Twin Peaks to me are um, the Killer's Reveal episode, the epi- not the Leland uh, uh, dying, but Leland killing Maddie, that episode, the yeah. finale where Cooper goes into the Red Room um, and Firewalk Me, this is pre-season three. I don't think you get any of those summits without Frost, first of all, deciding he wanted the Killer to be revealed, which I think was definitely a questionable decision and un, unquestioningly made for the wrong reasons, which was let's move past the Laura Palmer mystery, which is absolutely the wrong reason to do that. However, by making that decision and sort of forcing Lynch to deal with it, Lynch comes up with what might be the best work of his career at that point. And I think similarly with the finale where Cooper has been turned into this sort of flawed uh, downfalling hero that Lynch then has to work with and creates you know, his, his mini masterpiece, and then Firewalk With Me, which to me is kind of the summit of Twin Peaks, you only get because the killer was revealed, and it, and also because the show went so far astray that he had, you know, that's like a movie that it feels like Lynch just kind of vomited up, like it's it just comes right out of him in a way that nothing I've seen before him in his career does. Something like Eraserhead feels much more sort of meditated, uh, upon much more, you know, he made that over seven years. I think Firewalk with me was about nine months from conception. So it's a whole different type of Lynch film. And I would argue, and I think has huge, I think Lost Highway, Mulholland Drive, Inland Empire are all impossible to imagine without Firewalk with me and without for both positive and negative reasons. The fact that Lynch was forced to overcome these challenges uh, sent him in a new direction, which to me is probably the most interesting of his career. Where did you get the idea that it was Frost's decision to reveal the murderer? Uh, from a few sources, but primarily his own statements, particularly in 1990. He's all over newspapers and magazines saying, you know, well, we're we're going to reveal it eventually. We want to reveal it. We want to move on from it. He has a whole thing at some conference in the summer of 90 where he's speaking to all these journalists and he keeps emphasizing over and over that Twin Peaks is a big place. It's got many stories. This is just one. And I think if you look at his statements over the years, even after he's, and he had a statement in um, the intro to Jennifer Lynch's Secret Diary of Laura Palmer where he says, Mm -hmm. uh, and in that he presents it more as something that both of them exceeded to the uh, network on that they shouldn't have, but it's quite clear to me from the uh, the accounts that he gave, particularly at the time, I think he shifted his story a little bit over time and made it more of like a, well, I I reluctantly went along with the network, but it seems pretty clear to me that at that time he wanted to end the Laura Palmer mystery and move the show on so that it could continue for years with numerous stories, which as you can see from Secret History and really his work in general, which I've been looking into a lot lately for my own purposes. Uh, he loves this multiplicity of stories, whereas Lynch seems to be much more concerned with, even as they went and explored other directions, keeping the Laura story and the idea of her character and her mystery and her tragedy at the core of Twin Peaks. Okay. Um, well, how do I say this diplomatically? 
what Frost said in 1990 was pure making sure that he made no enemies at ABC. It was not his decision to end the, the, the mystery, nor did he want to. He, what he said later in the introduction to uh, Jennifer's book was true. Um, he told me when I interviewed him, and I found him to be a literate, charming, intelligent man whom I liked, uh, whose political opinions are much closer to mine than Lynch's <laughs> are. I mean, he is sort of having having dinner with Mark. It would be able to if if it had not if, if it had never been for Twin Peaks, we could have if we could have had a beautiful friendship. Um, <laughs> Um, if he wanted it. <laughs> um, okay. No. It was purely, um, and you know that I've written this many times, um, it was purely at the insistence of the of ABC, which could not fathom inconclusiveness. I mean, they, they just do not understand such a thing. Their brains are very much conditioned by uh, formulaic expectations, and they have no power of introspection. I've never met people who, you know, are in such, well, of course, now I can't really say that. I haven't met anybody in the Trump administration, but uh, mm-hmm. they don't have any power of introspection either. Um, but, um I mean, they have no power of introspection. It's just, this is the way a story is told. What the hell are you doing? Um, Okay, no. Frost told me that ABC never interfered with them. It's a pure lie. Yeah, you mentioned that in, um, I think, a footnote in the book. And I mentioned it in my article, um, Desire Under the uh, Douglas Firs. And I mentioned it in in uh, the Passion of David Lynch. I don't know if I use the word lie. That's it's a little brutal, but but it's true. He lied to me, um, and I kind of thought he was at the time because I know ABC. I did a lot of work for them. Um, I'm sure that they were uncompromising and unthinking and completely short-sighted. They had no idea what they had um, in, in David Lynch. Um, and, and Mark uh, saluted like a good little soldier because Mark comes from the formulaic world. He knows how to do it. David, I believe, and other people told me this, as I said, David never said a word. Um, uh other people told me that that David was really delighted to be working with somebody who really understood uh, the world of television, which he didn't know anything about. Right. Of course, by the time he got to 2017 and the third season of Twin Peaks, he did know. Um, okay, so no, Frost made no decisions uh, about that. He simply followed orders. Interesting. Um, okay. Uh, now, how just, how do those orders work? At the, do you know what sort of pressures were put upon them? Because I know they had their own production company, but of course, yes. ABC held the, you know, they oh, were yeah. distributing the show. Obviously, there's no well, they show had, without they held ABC. All the cards. Yeah. But what were they threatening cancellation, or like what would be the the mechanisms that they could put in place and say this? I guess it would be the spring, early summer of 1990 when they started writing this, the new season. Like, what, what did they Because they'd already greenlit it at that point, and it was on their fall schedule. Like, what could they, what could they do, do to sort of tell them, like, listen, like, this is on the table. You know, like the Mulholland Drive scene with the producers. This is the girl. What could they this put on the, the table? We, uh, honestly, what they that's what, that's what that, I mean, the Mulholland I know, Drive right? <laughs> is about the spirit of what David encountered oh, sure, yeah. at ABC. This is the girl. Um, you know, as people who spit up um, all all espressos. I mean, you know, sort of, who are we <laughs> dealing with here? Um, okay, so yeah, what did they do? Now, I I cannot tell you. 
Um, this is something nobody will ever tell me, or at least I think they won't. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, certainly not Mark. I, I have not spoken to him since I um, since I interviewed him. Uh, and, well, David might, but I don't know. Uh, I wouldn't count on it. Uh, but I will tell you what my experience was where um, an ABC liaison just came in and said, you have to blow this character up. We want you to you know, blow her up. Um, and there was you just couldn't say anything uh, about it. Now, what could they do? Um, the dynamics of this sort of thing are very subtle, and you have mm-hmm. to be there to understand it. I'm sure you understand that. Um, uh, so what they did, I don't know. But... Uh, what I would, this is my guess, it's a fairly educated guess, but it is a guess. He was working in a hostile environment, and he closed down, because mm-hmm. that's what an artist is like. I can't give you the answer to your very, um, uh, you know, very very justified question, what did they do? You know, sometimes they don't do anything. Sometimes it's just a look. Yeah, you know, psychological. You know it's World War III if you don't do it. Do you want to take on World War III? Well, some of them do. And some of them, you know, Norman Lear, I'm guessing, you know, when he started All in the Family, I'm I'm guessing various pressures were um, um, brought to bear on him, and he just had just raised the middle finger. (laughs) And and that was it. Um, uh, David's not like that. Interesting. Um, uh yeah uh and uh so no i i think that if it's anybody that you want to give credit to for forcing david to respond <laughs> it's got to be abc and i don't even know who i mean you know i'd so, love to be able to tell you who the guy was or who the woman was because it's perfectly possible it was a woman um but but i don't know is your perception of frost that he was, like Lynch, would have preferred to have Laura, but kind of said, okay, we've got to do this, or that he was indifferent to it, or maybe... Because I think Microsoft... I certainly believe that ABC had massive pressure on them, but I, from his things he said, not just at the time, but also later, kind of had the impression that he thought fundamentally it was okay. The show, A, can survive this, and B, um, and this is where I'm, I'm, I suppose I'm out on more of a limb, but um, just based on how he perceived or doesn't perceive the character of Laura Palmer to begin with, that he thought, yeah, this is probably healthy for the show in the long run. We've got to have, you know, uh, other facts. There. But, but from your perception, it sounds more like you feel he was on the same page as Lynch and then said, well, I guess we can't carry on this way. Cause I a- wouldn't go that far. Okay. What I will say to you is <sighs> it's possible he doesn't know the answer to your question. Fair enough, yeah. For the reason that when you are a soldier working in formula television, in order to continue living, you know, in order to continue functioning, you frequently have to convince yourself that what you're being forced to do is for the best. Well, you have to say to yourself, wait a second, maybe they have a point, you know, um, and um, some people grit their teeth and, and say, this is hogwash, that I, I need the money. Um, and some people say, well, you know, this won't be fatal because there are a lot of stories in Twin Peaks, you know. I mean, that's what that sounds like to me. There are a lot of stories. Well, there are a lot of stories in Twin Peaks, you know. So you, you say to yourself, all right. This is, of course, something that Lynch never could or would say to him himself. So you get, you know, what does a man like Lynch do if he's boxed in? Uh, well, maybe there are a number of things that it it seems to me that he shut down. Yeah. In, uh, in at that time, and that when he was negotiating with um, Showtime. You saw what he had learned when he said, I'm leaving. 
Yeah, right. <laughs> under, under these conditions, I don't do it. And Showtime thought that they could do the show without him. And the the, the pushback was so was so enormous. I don't know if any of them actually understood better than the people at ABC. I have no experience working with Showtime, so yes. no, I don't. I I really think you are on shaky ground um, about uh, Frost's influence on David. Uh, well, I, I don't think it's the influence on him so much as I assumed that the conditions, I think I, I may have too tightly intertwined the industrial conditions and Frost's active role in that, put it that way. Because okay. the, uh, the the overarching point is I, I, I see Lynch as pivoting um, in a, in some ways a very new I think quite rich direction in his career after being confronted with having to reveal uh, Lars Killer and all of the implications of that and the way he did it with the scene with Maddie um, sort of kept. And I was, I also find it interesting as a side note, that was the first thing he cut with Mary Sweeney as his editor was the reveal episode. And supposedly oh, right? they, oh. they bonded quite close, closely over that experience. And I think That's very interesting. their work together is another whole interesting <laughs> collaboration. But, um, um, you know, I'm not entirely certain that David didn't want to let us know that uh, Leland was possessed by Bob. It's a question of, uh, and I can say this in my book, uh, Bob's gone. Remember yeah. what I said? Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Bob's gone. Really? Where does God go? You know, I mean, yeah. <laughs> when you have an influence like that in the world, it goes away. Um, so, no, I don't know that he was unhappy about revealing. I mean, because the yeah. sort of Bob Leland um, uh, merging, which makes for a figure that so much articulates his idea of the universe right. that things are not one or two, but somewhere between one and two. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that works very well for him. Um, I think it was the attempt to say, well, we now know the answer. I think that had they given him his head, that what we found in season three would have been in season two. Um, you know, where things just, you know, issues just keep multiplying. Uh, and whatever sol solution you think you come to, you just open up six more questions. I think that's the difference, not the rev the revelation okay. of Bob. Um, yeah. However, I have flirted with the idea that, because I don't know the answer to this question, I have flirted with the idea that the failure of Twin Peaks Season 2 did open up new aesthetic possibilities for him. And that works. As, I mean, that's what artists do, don't they? The fact that that they made him end the story, or at least they thought right. they did, because he right. got them in the end. I don't know whether he knows or not um, himself, or whether any creative person would know or not, because I think that, you know, uh, like like the greatest, um, like Fellini, like, you know, sort of the really great filmmakers, uh, he has a very creative response to accident. Well, let's go about, uh, I guess, sort of the other aspect of what I was saying, which was with Cooper. Um, there, I think, you know, this is something that you brought up in your work, this idea that, that Frost kind of had a different conception of Cooper. You talk a lot about how he sort of saw him in a more of a Sherlockian uh, light, uh, quite explicitly, I think. And yeah, yeah. Uh, Lynch's version is much more intuitive and responsive. The idea of a detective not as somebody sort of forcing his way through the world, but somebody responding to what the world offers and kind of taking different threads. Um, is that a, would you concur with that? Uh, uh, yes, just one one small, just one small um, maybe nuance, and that is not just responding, but yes, responding is very important, um, but also uh, to being. Uh, um, a um, a figure of expansion, whereas mm. uh, 
Sherlock is a figure of contraction. Cooper, Lynch, and Frost had sort of different visions of him. That was sort of the other half of my of my argument that I think Frost has had, for better or worse, uh, some sort of tangible influence on Lynch and his work and on the shape of of Lynch's work in Twin Peaks. I'll put the ball in your court. Do you see season three's vision of this multifaceted, fragmented Cooper, as you say, more than one but less than two? Uh, how much of that do you see rooted in the fact that Lynch and Frost seem to have had quite different conceptions of this character and that those conceptions came to a head in the season two finale in the first place? Um, I don't think it has anything to do with it at all. Oh, maybe I'm misunderstanding the question, but uh, I think what Lynch is, is about, and I think it's not possible that Frost had anything to do with it, um, is uh, this whole... Um, I read him a, a Yeats poem, Lynch, once, called Byzantium, Um and one of the lines is, fresh images that yet, fresh images beget. Boy, he loved that, and <laughs> I do too. Uh, every time, I, you know, I find David Chase to be very similar. He's not as as free as Lynch is, and he would be the first to tell you that he's not, that this is an ideal that he has. Uh, the sense that whatever you say uh, suddenly, you know, 35 other possibilities arise. Um, I think that uh, the fragmentation of Cooper, which goes way beyond um, the three Coopers, the Dougie Cooper, the Mr. C. Cooper, and the Cooper Cooper, within what we see in um, season three, Cooper is capable of fragmenting infinitely. Uh, when you get to the end, and they're in the um, in the motel, he is neither Cooper nor Mister C, but some sort of combination. Mm-hmm. And um, I think this is part of 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 David's aesthetic and his vision, and that were he to do a season four, which he has never told me he's going to do or even thinking about doing, uh, but were he to do it, I think it would just go in that direction, that, you know, whatever you've got, there's a thousand other um, facets to it. Um, And I don't think that has anything to do with Frost, who um, I think is a talented man, but he's a contractor. You know, the universe contracts with him. I'm not wanting to diss what formulaic writers do. I'm sure I'm not capable of doing more myself. Uh, uh, And I'm not willing, I'm not interested in dissing uh, Frost, not at all, but I'm not interested. And he did tell me some of the things that he had invented. I think by the time I saw him, he was already feeling that, uh, you know, that there were people saying that he wasn't particularly talented. Um, And he wanted to, you know, say, well, but look, I did this. And he did do those things. And he was the one who came up with, according to him, and I think he wasn't lying when he said this, the dangling um, um, traffic light. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, you'd think that Lynch came up with it, but now he came up with it, and and it's wonderful. Would it be fair to say, I guess, to sort of wrap up the questions about the partnership? Because I see it as a dialectic of Lynch Frost. Yeah, I know you to do. Me like, <laughs> right. It sounds to me like maybe you see it more as incidental. You're not denying that Frost brought things to the show, but just that the things that Lynch brought are would interest you more, and you don't see much overlap between the two. I think that's a very, uh, pretty fair statement, yeah. Do you want to talk about Sopranos for a little bit? I'll give you my own kind of quick thoughts on Sopranos, and then you can riff on those or offer whatever you'd like. I, I do want to get into it a little bit. I think for me it was interesting reading this book and reading about Sopranos because I watched that show before I watched Twin Peaks. I didn't see Twin Peaks until 2008, and I watched Sopranos as it was on, so it right. was kind of revisiting something in a way for me and reminding me both of what I loved about the show, but also interestingly, very interestingly, given the thesis of your book, 
things that I found frustrating about it. And at the time, I was a total 100% movie person. Um, and we haven't talked about this at all, but I think just as there's sort of uh, some tension between you know, formulaic, the non-formulaic, the episodic, the serialized within TV, I think some of those tensions are manifested between film and TV in interesting ways where TV mm-hmm. can do some things or has the potential to do things that a feature film cannot, a narrative feature film, and the feature film can do some things that a TV show couldn't. And what I found, it's interesting because what I, one of the things I found frustrating about Sopranos at the time was both like a marker of it being non-formulaic, but also possibly a marker of it being somewhat bound by television. I think particularly there was a season where Steve Buscemi was a guest star and there was this whole sort of story built up about him yes. over the season. And it ended, as I recall, sort of just with a bit of a whimper. Like it was like, Not okay, the all. end of the season. And this is again... 10, 12 shot. years ago. Yes, exactly. Um, yes, yeah, so I remember that. Big. But it felt very perfunctory to me. Like, really? okay, it's the end of the season, time to kill off this character, move on to the next one. And I was frustrated by the idea that huh. they couldn't, they were, it didn't feel to me like they were building towards something bigger the way that a movie would. And it seemed like it was falling into, and again, this is me, I was probably 22, 23, this was 2006 or seven or so. So I'm reaching back across the mists of time. Okay. But I think for me, the end of the series was almost a more successful version of that for me and a commentary upon this idea that um, there's a certain drift in TV at times um, where it's, you can't you can't do the sort of building or ascending that you can do in in film, and I think it's quite notable that for me, Twin Peaks does reach that culmination uh, in a film. To me, Fire Walk with Me is is the summit of Twin Peaks, right. and I think that's interesting to think about. So for me, yes, it, it there was some there was some frustration there in the fact that Sopranos, I guess, couldn't be a film; it was a TV show, but you know, you're pointing out the many ways in which it actually quite strongly differs from TV and particularly that sort of smallness that TV embodied for so many years. That's where I was coming from I reading see. this, where that was like my first favorite show before I'd watched Twin Peaks. It was like, this is the best thing I've seen TV do. And it still there felt like it couldn't, by its very nature almost, couldn't get where I wanted it to go but maybe it shouldn't have maybe it was stronger for not going there I don't know that was just my impression at the time well that's a very interesting thing that you're saying Um, we come to entertainment everything with uh, very strong expectations and when those expectations are disappointed we have a couple of choices Uh, or a few choices. One is to say, I didn't like that. Uh, Another is to say, why why is that happening? Uh, Another is to say, how is that different from what I expected? And how do I understand the nature of my expectation with what I was given? You know, Mm. the contrast, excuse me, the contrast between my expectation and and what I was given. And uh, I think that that's an extremely important um, place to be when you're looking at auteur television. Because Mm. of necessity, your expectations are being disappointed as well as shocked. When your expectation is just shocked, that's kind of interesting. When your expectation is disappointed, it's very easy, too easy, to say, oh, I don't like it, without saying, wait a minute. (laughs) It's going in a very different place. What do I get from where it's going that I didn't get from what I expected to happen? Mm -hmm. And um, it seems to me that the most important thing about 
how we learn and grow um, as people, as literate people, as Americans, from looking at art television is how we deal with the disappointment of our expectations. Sometimes something is just bad, right? Right. It's it's (laughs) badly written. It's terrible. It's a mess. Uh, Sometimes what you were led to expect, which is, of course, what I believe, um, is a conditioning that works against truth. Mm. And you become disappointed by truth. Um. And how do you know the difference between the two? I mean, sure, I, I think that's an absolutely mm. reasonable question. And the important thing is curiosity and discipline. And time, you're a person who has very lively curiosity, native curiosity. So this is what you're going to do one way and the other a lot of the time, but not all of the time. And I find that it's true of everybody. You're not always on top of getting into something that you've never seen before. Sometimes you need the help of a fellow critic, a colleague, you know, to help you along. Or sometimes just an innocent, um, naive remark by somebody makes you say, oh, wait a mm-hmm. second, there's really something to look at there. Okay, so the whole whole crux of of, of all of this is, Curiosity and discipline, um, and in a way that neither one cancels out the other. Uh, I do notice that among websites that are dedicated to various TV shows, there are people who are immensely curious, but they're not disciplined at all, and they get themselves into you know kind of stupid misreadings, where in fact all they're looking at is a roar shock of their own impulses. Um, so sometimes you you know sometimes people like that somehow go on from there. Sometimes they're stunted and they stay there, which is very unfortunate. Um, but um, you really need both. You need to be curious, and then in the end, you need to be disciplined. You need to start by being curious, and in the end, you have to be disciplined, asking yourself all the questions, sort of what. Why didn't it go where I thought it would go? Where did it go? Um, if it had gone where I wanted, what would it have said about life? Uh, that it's not going where I thought it would go. What does it say about life? And I think Sopranos, at its best, really, uh, it did result in those sort of epiphanies. Because I think, you know, what I sometimes I, I was I think the the sensation I was missing that I got from movies that I did not get from T V shows and even Sopranos was catharsis. And Sopranos is in many ways an anti cathartic show at and I think at its best quite intensely and are uh, and brilliantly so. Like I think the ending is that I think that's very nicely stated. And and I the you, I liked that you mentioned the uh, episode with the soccer coach who he's going to kill and then he doesn't. Uh, okay. That for me, when I saw that episode, um, probably not long after it aired, uh, at, up until that point, I had started watching the show and I thought this is just this is a very nicely written uh, gangster show. It's it's not like a you know it's it's a fun, artfully done. I I think I was thinking of it like you described some of those. Other shows is really well done formulaic like, television. Uh, Columbus. That moment was the first time where I was sort of had my breath taken away, and I said, "No, this is something. This is actually uh, this this is like a great work. There's something <laughs> right, really right. going." And I mean, I was like a teenager at the time. I was I think very much Boca, into like revenge right? stuff, and oh, you want to see the you know. And there was something just so perfectly executed about that twist where it's the most, and it's exactly as you wrote it in the book, it's it's like one of the most, you'd think one of the most justified situations to want Tony to be like the good bad guy, who, you know, and, and it didn't, it went totally somewhere else, and he himself doesn't know why, and he's stumbling around quoting drunk. gangster movies <laughs> to himself and drunken, and and that that was like the first inkling I had of the show's greatness, I think. So I think oh, that is, it, it, it took, what maybe even was a feature of the medium 
a sort of anti-cathartic. Uh, and, you know, this is me coming to TV is still, even though I've watched a lot more and I'm sort of breaking it down in a more, um, even a more formulaic way at times, trying to kind of get into the meat of it and figure out how these things work. Um, I'm still kind of coming to it from a movie sensibility. And I think one of the things that I appreciate about great television is it can take a sort of an anti-catharsis that is embedded in its form that is true to life. Mm-hmm. Life is often not very cathartic. No. And kind of render that as its artistic point. I think Sopranos does that really well. Well, I'm expecting to see David Chase this weekend, and I will tell him what you said. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> well, I do. I guess I'll throw one more question out there. This is a relation between girls, which I've never watched. And it wasn't that interesting watching, I suppose, because of what you talk in the book about Lena Dunham's sort of public um, presence and, and all the sort of controversy that swirls around her, unfortunately, I think, sometimes gets in the way of, with with many I'm afraid creators, so, yeah, I'm afraid so. The work. I, I'll say, after reading this chapter, I was way more curious to watch it now. Like, it, it, it you described, right. a, and, and your way of sort of uh, engaging with it, I thought, was really compelling. So... I actually, this is a more of a question about Twin Peaks in a way, but it's it's sort of based off of what you wrote about with girls. Okay. I wanted to hear you talk about the new Twin Peaks and the old, but particularly the new, in light of the mind-body dichotomy idea, as well as the rearticulation of the relationship between mind and body, which you brought up in the girls' chapter. I was struck particularly by a lot of the uh, female characters in Twin Peaks, Diane, Audrey, and Sarah, all seem kind of relevant to that very that that issue as you express it, um, or that phenomenon as you express it in relation to girls. Um, gosh, that's interesting. I've never thought about that before. It's a really, really, uh, it's a great question. Well, to um, start with, I guess for the listener, how would you describe the mind? body um, dichotomy or, or rearticulation of the dichotomy that you see in girls. So they have a sense um, of what I mean by that. I would really need to give this a lot of thought. Uh, maybe um, this will be part of the follow-up uh, someday. A, another time. <laughs> Mad Men and uh, The Wire. But I can give you a little a little sure. something, but I don't want you to take it as a final word. Okay. Because I'm just sort of putting it together as I'm sitting here. But... When I think of body, I think of Audrey dancing. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that it seems to me, the difference, uh, which I mentioned in in the the, uh, the first Twin Peaks chapter, not the one at the end about a season three, Mm -hmm. Um, but in the the chapter about the breakthrough Mm -hmm. that that the first two seasons of of Twin Peaks were, for for uh, for television, I I contrasted Audrey uh, um, consciously and manipulatively using her sexy body to distract the um, the Norwegians to mm-hmm. get even with her father or to get her father to notice her. I mean, you can sort of get into that. Uh, and when she's dancing, where her body is kind of flowing. Uh, in rhythm to something beyond herself. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't think that that's what girls is about. I think that what girls is about is, um, as I said at the beginning, that body is as much a function of understanding the nature of human complexity as mind and uh that from a from this particular Lena Dunham's female sensibility she's looking at the world of relationship and the world of commerce as well from the point of view of what's happening to our bodies mm and that isn't what what Lynch is doing. Interesting. That's, I mean, that's all I can say now. But I'm I'm really grateful for this question, as I am for a number of the questions that you've thrown at me. This is this has been uh, a complete.
complete delight to me. I'll talk to you anytime. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, yeah, I just, even as you were answering that, I was thinking of, uh, and I know you said it's not that connected to lunch, but this, the the juxtaposition in part 16 of Diane and Cooper, with Cooper waking up and being this sort of artificial he-man walking around, you know, with the thumbs up and I'm the FBI, then contrasted with Diane's very physical breakdown, I mean, literally a breakdown at one point where she decomposes, um, as yeah. she kind or the Diane Tulpa or whatever as as she kind of relives this trauma of that she experienced with Mr. C. So I don't so yeah, it's it's as it's as different. we kinda of go back and forth on this, it's like yeah. new sort of But I like I like rise. very much the contrast because as you know in the book I contrasted uh Dunham's girls with sitcoms and mm, how they treat yeah. relationships. And the formulaic notion of relationship where um, there is such a thing as maturity and there is such a thing as responsibility and there is such a thing as, um, you know, the family, very much in sitcoms, the family. And how and how Dunham, looking at it from a very complex and modernistic point of view, is questioning everything that we believe about that through the very – a genre that mm. has traditionally affirmed it, yeah. affirmed all the truisms. Uh, I mean, I really think that poor girl who had she took she she was um, she was she had to endure such pressure and such hostility, and she was too young; she couldn't cope mm. with it. Um, but my God, that girl created something really amazing in in that series that I think basically has been so misread and misunderstood. Did you speak to her at all in the preparation for I the book? I tried like hell. If mm. anybody knows how I can get in touch with her, <laughs> give me a call. I could not get a hold of her. I did everything I could, but it just didn't work. Um, but, yeah, I'd really love to talk to her. I'd love to show her the book. Um when you mentioned the whole thing with the like particularly the episode where she goes um and she lives with the doctor for like a day or something oh, and it's like many. she's entered into a sort of a sitcom or not a like a romantic comedy yes. um for the moment it reminded me uh, but how she's aware of those that it's not sort of a bubble and there's the whole world around it, it reminded me quite a lot of how you contextualize uh the straight story within Lynch's over as being as I think you used the decoherence yeah was the term yeah it, so that that uh speaking of connections that's something that really popped into mind um well one last oh, question before, I, before we may go. i just make one statement sure yeah i love the way you make connections i love it it's rare and it's beautiful oh, thank you. and uh it's going to serve you very well thank you for all this time and content this was a long I think that our first conversation. Just you know, give me a link to it or it or them or they oh, uh, when it's when when you've got it. Anyway, right. as I said, I've really enjoyed it. Thank you so much.